if anybody doesn't know, I, I'm Andy Agafangelo. I'm the founder of the Transparency Task Force. We are an international collaborative community that is dedicated to improving the way the financial services uh, sector works. We have a very, very clearly defined mission. Our mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial services sector that it, so that it serves society better. And our so that it serves society better. And our look our long term uh, our long term uh, build um, an international highly respected and those two words are extremely important to me an international highly respected institution that will focus on helping to ensure that consumers around the world get very very good outcomes we're busy developing what we call a framework for financial reform and at the heart of that framework for finance reform are what we call the 12 finance development goals. Now these 12 finance development goals are akin to the United Nations sustainable development goals. But instead of dealing with general planetary issues such as environment, society and so on, our 12 finance development goals relate to the 12 drivers of good conduct and good behavior and good outcomes within the financial services sector. They cover all the obvious topics, topics such as leadership, topics such as culture, incentives, so on and so forth. But it won't surprise any of you to know that technology is one of them. We believe that technology has a very important part to play in ensuring that everybody that interacts with the financial services sector has the chance to get good outcomes. And of course, you'll all understand that good outcomes in financial services from a technology point of view, uh, one of the prerequisites is an open, free, effective marketplace. And if we want an open, free, effective marketplace, we absolutely do need to fully harness the power and the efficiency of standards. Now, some six years ago, I had my first um, interaction with the world of standards in financial services. And frankly, it wasn't an enjoyable experience. I'll tell you all a little bit about it. Um, the pensions regulator in the UK had realized that for the UK's pensions auto enrollment market to work efficiently, there needed to be a data standard in place to help masses of data move effectively from the payroll industry to the pensions industry. And there were three problems. First of all, there were a lack of standards within the payroll industry. Secondly, there were a lack of standards within the pensions industry. And thirdly, and a hugely problematic issue, there were a general lack of standards between the payroll and the pensions industry. And a group had been working together on a voluntary basis to try to sort this out, but frankly, they weren't getting very far. And the reason they weren't getting very far is they all were focused on trying to achieve what they individually wanted to achieve. They were all trying to argue why the standard that they adopted was the one that um, was closest to whatever they perceived to be right for themselves. One way of describing this would be to say that they all were focused on what they wanted as opposed to what the market needed. And having attended a meeting about this topic, I realized that they're simply wasn't enough collaboration amongst the group to actually drive this issue forward. To cut a long story short, the pensions regulator invited me to take over the chairmanship of the group. I did. And I'm very pleased to say that a year or so later, we developed something called the Pensions and Payroll Data Interface Standard. And to do that, we had to find a way to overcome two very obvious sets of challenges. One very obvious challenge was the technical issues. Yeah, there were real technical issues that had to be overcome. But far bigger than that in so many ways were the issues that I would label mindset. There needed to be a sense of collaboration. There needed to be a sense of camaraderie. There needed to be a sense of everybody willing to forego what they personally may have wanted in the attempt to make sure that the industry as a whole got what it needed. 
And I'm very pleased to say that um, the net result is that eventually everybody got onto that wavelength. And having had that experience, some of which was frankly not enjoyable, it really was a case of having to bang people's heads together from time to time. Having had that experience, I came away with a very strong feeling that, you know what, there must be so much totally unnecessary friction in the system within the financial services sector as a direct consequence of the inability of individuals and organizations to find ways to work collaboratively. So myself and a couple of guys set up a group called the Interoperability Steering Group. We got quite excited about this idea of interoperability. That group then morphed into the Transparency Task Forces, FinTech Interoperability and Open Finance Group. And I've had a real interest in the subject ever since. Very briefly, in June of last year, I heard Willie Bramitz of the Actus Research Foundation give a presentation in Zurich about Actus and it blew my mind. I was seriously excited by the power of the ideas within Actus. And that led to some ongoing dialogue between myself and the guys at Actus and also the Bank of England of the Financial Conduct Authority. And that's what's taken us to where we are today. So allow me please everybody to just set the scene in terms of where we are and frankly, what we're trying to do. I'll tell you where we are, as I see it. We're at the beginning of a really ambitious so ambitious, by the way, that I've had a couple of folks tell me this is a waste of time and they might be right. But let me tell you what, what I think we're trying to do. We're trying to build an international team of subject matter experts who have two special qualities. One, technical competence, of course, but secondly, a true authentic desire to break through the barriers. And we know that breaking through these barriers for change is going to require very high levels of collaboration, very high levels of cooperation. And we also believe, I believe this passionately, that it is perfectly possible for the financial services industry to find ways of working together to break down the barriers, to kick away the obstacles, to drive forward and do stuff that is seriously, seriously exciting. There is probably nothing stopping us from a technical point of view to drive a massive paradigm shift forward in the way that data standards work within financial services, particularly in relation to regula regulatory reporting. And of course, regulatory reporting is a very, very important topic. It's not the only topic, but it's a hugely important topic. And that's why we're here today. Everybody that's involved in this session has expressed some degree of enthusiasm for being part of a group that's going to try to shake things up, part of a group that wants to have really honest, constructive conversations, very honest, very constructive conversations about what the possibilities are and about what can be achieved through collaboration. So if you're here with a mindset of enthusiasm, because you want to be here, a mindset of yes we can because we can, a mindset of there will be technical problems but we can collectively overcome them, then you are most definitely in the right place. Now I, I run the Transparency Task Force and I'm going to be ultra transparent with everybody. My objective from this meeting today is to recruit people who want to become involved with ongoing dialogue to really push out the envelope about what is possible in the data standards space within financial services. And it might be that that means we have two of you, or it might be that we have 22 of you, or it might be that absolutely everybody on the session chooses to be involved with what we're trying to do. So that's it. That's the very clear, explicit, transparent agenda that I've got to create a community internationally that's made up of people with two special qualities. As I mentioned, quality number one is technical competence and quality number two is this highly collaborative mindset. So I hope that sets the scene for everybody. Um, in terms of the housekeeping notes, we're going to make very, very good use of the chat. 
Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with chat. If you don't know how to use chat within Zoom, you just look for the speech bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. Please do feel very, very free to share your thoughts, your ideas, links to concepts, links to contact details, whatever you want. If this is going to operate as a team of people, we need to start learning how to engage and communicate with each other. I guess the house rules are, please, please, please just be honest with your thoughts. Of course, please, please be constructive in the dialogue. We welcome disagreement. We welcome challenge. We want people to say, no, that won't work because. We also want people to say, that will work because we could do it this way. Okay, but whatever the dialogue is, let's make sure we, uh, the tone is always constructive and, and hopefully balanced. Okay, in just about one minute, I'm going to pass over to Angus from the Bank of England. Angus has been absolutely instrumental in helping us to get to this point. Um, he'll be talking about these issues from the Bank of England's perspective, and that's going to help the scene, help to set the scene rather. We're then going to have Andrew Beale from the Financial Conduct Authority. We're then going to have Gavin Stark speaking. Um, and some of you may not yet know Gavin Stark, but I assure you he's a gentleman who's got tremendous, successful, pretty recent experience of what can be achieved through collaboration in relation to data standards. We've then got some breakout sessions, and then we've got Alan Mendelowitz, one of the guys, actors, to talk about some ideas that he would like to share. The two breakout groups. Um, the two breakout groups are covering, number one, the vision statement. What we mean by the vision statement, folks, is very, very simple. We want to free up everybody. We want to um, unconstrain and unchain everybody's thinking about what the possibilities are. That's why we're dealing with the vision statement before the problem statement. If we have a problem statement first, it can actually bog us down in the weeds and get us focused on problems rather than possibilities. So in the vision statement part of the session, that's a chance for everybody to share what they can see right out there on the horizon and so to speak beyond it in terms of what the possibilities actually are. Be very, very free thinking in that session. When we come to talk about the problem statement, that's when we kind of bring ourselves back down to earth and discuss the issues that are all about the barriers that need to be overcome. In closing, just before I pass over to Angus, uh, in closing, I just simply want to say this. Um, I'm 56 years of age, and like all of you, I've encountered problems and challenges in my life. There have been parts of my life that have gone absolutely sailing, and there have been parts of my life when things have been really, really difficult. But I can honestly tell you that I don't think I've ever experienced anything that I've really wanted to happen, that I haven't in some way been able to make happen just through sheer determination, effort, stubbornness, and everything else. So please, 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 folks, do not al allow the inevitable problems on the way to get in the way of progress. I implore you all to approach this exercise, this endeavor, with a sense of optimism, realism, determination, hope, and friendship. Now, you might think friendship's a strange word to be using on a session like this about technology and standards. Let, let me explain. If we get the dynamic right amongst us as a group, yeah, if we build relationships between us based on trust, if we have complete respect for the different perspectives that we have, we can achieve a huge amount in a relatively short period of time. My final point before I pass over to Angus is this. Um, let's give it all we've got. Who knows what we're capable of achieving? We'll only know what we're capable of achieving if we go for it. So uh, can I please now invite Angus to um, to unmute and introduce himself and share with us all the perspective from the Bank of England's point of view. Um, one small bit of housekeeping, very simply, in the top right hand corner, I urge you to have um, a gallery view showing, because if you have gallery view showing, it simply means that you are in speaker view, which means that whoever's speaking is going to dominate the large part of your screen. So you should have um, gallery view showing or a little matrix of dots if you're seeing the word speak of you, click on it. That will get you into speak of you, and that will then enable you to see Angus and the other speakers um, nice and clearly. 
Okay, so um, Angus, I invite you please to unmute yourself and to introduce yourself and go from there. Thank you very much, Angus. Over. Thanks, Andy. First, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but it sounds like it's not a particularly good line, Angus, but carry on anyway. Okay, I will do my best to speak clearly. That's better, thank you. So, so first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy, and to the Transparency Task Force for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to speak uh, at, at your symposium on data standards. Uh, and thanks very much for uh, organizing an event on this topic. Um, before I talk a bit about why, perhaps a quick introduction to myself. Why am I interested in all this stuff? Um, so, um, and, and an analyst, I became pretty frustrated um, that the data, um, that well, in order to do good analytics, um, I needed good data. And often the data I had wasn't particularly good. Um, and that got me uh, from a bunch of clearing houses uh, in the UK. Um, uh, and that project, the data collection process um, wasn't as good. I'm going to make a suggestion, uh, Davis, because you're, you're. As I'd like to, to have been. Forgive yeah. me, your line's quite bad, so I have this suggestion. We're going to go to Andy Beale now. We're going to switch the two speakers around. So we're going to go to Andy Beale now. So I hope you're prepared, Andy. In the meantime, we'll invite Angus to do two things. First of all, when you come back, uh, go to um, uh, audio only. In other words, forget video. That might help. And, and secondly, please, to uh, see if you can do something to improve the bandwidth at your end. So, Mr. Andrew Beale, can I invite you, please, to unmute and pick up from there. This is going to be a test of your ability to uh, respond quickly to changing circumstances. Imagine you're in a training session, Andy, and this has all been orchestrated for you. Off you go. Yeah, Thank you. you know, I'm well up for it. And, and to be honest, Andy, after the after the motivational speech you've just given, I am I am I'm ready to break down some walls. I'm very excited. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So, well, obviously, Angus has already said 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 quite a lot about them. Um, thank, thanking you for. for getting everybody together. And um, I really do think uh, that, um, you know, we, we've been working in the FCA on, on this sort of topic for quite a few years or related topics related to automation, I suppose. Automation, making things simpler and easier, uh, you know, the, the burden of regulatory reporting f f is, is a key barrier actually for, for many firms to to enter markets, etc., and it's not just in in financial services. And to be honest, this is I've only been working in the FCA for about nine, ten months now. Uh, my my background's in in healthcare, uh, and uh, I have also worked some time in media. And, and in healthcare, I, I'm not sure if people know this, but um, there's a, a thing called the International Classification of Diseases, and that has a code for every single thing that can go wrong with you, uh, including things like bitten by a Gila monster. That has its own code. So if you're bitten by a Gila monster anywhere in the world, there is the facility to have used the same code to, uh, to recognize what actually went wrong with you. Um, and, and, I, and I came, I, I, sort of, I, I thought to be honest, everywhere had this sort of capability to, uh, to codify and have a standard way of describing stuff in the same way. Um, and uh, so I sort of gradually learned from my career, I'm, I'm 52 now, that um, that, that isn't necessarily the case. Uh, and, and to be honest, you know, the people that are actually uh, doing the coding uh, weren't necessarily trained in, in how to, how to recognise all these scribbles from all of the, the different doctors that had written stuff in their notes. So, yeah, we, there, we've obviously got issues there about, you know, you can have a standard, but whether everybody can actually implement it in a standard way is... Is obviously going to be is, is obviously going to be difficult, um, but sort of sort of swiftly moving on to sort of this topic now, I, I think um, as I mentioned, you know, financial services has a huge amount of you know we're just coming at it from the regulatory reporting perspective. Yeah, you know, the the certainly since the financial crisis, the explosion in regulatory reports, the data requirements has been enormous. 
Uh, this has caused all sorts of issues about parallel data architectures happening within organizations. You know, what, what, it, what's the one version of the truth? How are these things being calculated, et cetera, et cetera. Every, everybody doing it in the same way. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you've then sort of got a, got a challenge in being able to use this information to create a, a regulatory radar. And I suppose that's, that's sort of what we're aiming to create is this sort of regulatory radar so that we are getting early identification or, of harms or risks or, or challenges for consumers or particular firms or particular products and services in the marketplace. But the key thing is that radar goes around frequently. You can't just have radar going once a year because that doesn't really tell you very much about what the risks are. Um, so you need a trusted way to have a pulse check on what's going on. Uh, and this doesn't just need to be from uh, regulations. You know, there's a huge amount of regulations, but there's many, many sources of data now. So um, I think that, uh, you know, what, we, what we're looking to do now and links into what Ang Angus is sort of going to talk about, we need to look at now about what actual data does a regulator need to um, to create this sort of radar to understand the harms. Uh, we need to work out what are the standard ways if we are actually asking for data from, from firms, you know, can we do that in a more standardized way, which, which everybody can talk about. But there are many standards out there. There are international standards. There are all sorts of standards out there already. So what's the way to, to act as a sort of help? We're interested in it, but what's the way to act as a sort of more of a catalyst? We're interested. But how do we move this forward so that is in the benefits to Andy's point of consumers, of firms, of everybody else? Um, and, and that's sort of a, a critical question. There's no point in us facilitating and organizing all of this ourselves. So we are very interested in this topic. It's going to be a critical way in which uh, 21st century regulation should happen and, and will happen. And the sort of final point is that this is the very first sort of tentative steps. We're in a scoping phase at the moment. These are our very, very first steps within the organization today uh, about how, how this could work and what we might help catalyze. There, there are lots of places that have already talked about this, tried to, tried to do things in, in multiple ways. We, we need to find a way that's right for the, you know, being parochial, right for the UK and the UK firms and the UK market, but which also speaks internationally. And I think it's that, uh, that route map, I think the end goal, I think we can potentially envision in some way we need to understand what that is but see that but uh, but what's the route map to get there so so i'm going to be really interested in finding out more from from the huge wealth of experience in the in the virtual room that we've got today and and, and thank you so much for your uh, your input and time thank you andy that sets the scene very very nicely from the fca's perspective i love the phrase regulatory radar um, I can just imagine this idea of regulatory radar working, automatically detecting issues and problems and all those sorts of things that matter to all of us. Uh, I'd also like, if I may, to pick up on one quick point before we pass over to Angus, which is um, you made a really valid point. We have some phenomenally experienced and competent, you know, th true thought leaders around this topic from around the world with us today. And I am absolutely flattered by the the level of uh, competence and capability this, this initiative has so, has so far attracted. It's, it's wonderful that you've given up your time and your effort to be with us today. And we really all do want to access that treasure chest of insight. I've had some phenomenally uh, positive, exciting, informative conversations over the last roughly six weeks or so with many, many, many of you. And absolutely everybody is going to be open and willing and invited to share whatever it is that you can share. We've also got folks within the session who come at things from a slightly different point of view, perhaps a more, more of a governance of data perspective or perhaps a policy making or regulatory uh, policy perspective. All of this is very, very important uh, ingredient content to the to the mix that we're trying to create so andy thank you very much indeed for uh, for setting the scene there and um i think it's wonderful from my point of view that the fca and the bank of england of course are approaching this endeavor in such a participative and collaborative way okay great 
Let's now go to Angus. Um, Angus, depending on how it goes, feel free to use the video or stay on just audio, depending on how you get on. But I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself. Um, so the bottom left hand uh, icon, you've obviously hit it already. Angus, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Angus, we can't hear you right now. It might be that we've got a bit of a techie problem with Angus. These things do happen, folks. If that is the case, we're going to move very, very swiftly on to Gavin Starks. I'll try to check in with Angus once more. Um, once more. Oh, I think I know the problem. Um, Angus has dialed in on his mobile, which makes complete sense. And I need to unmute his mobile, I think. So I think we should be listening to... Angus in just a second. Yes, we are. Angus, over to you. Thank you very much indeed for your initiative in solving that technical problem. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me all? Does that work? We can hear you well. Thank you. Great. Well, hopefully this is a little bit clearer than the previous, uh, the previous my computer uh, and uh, the broadband and broad bandwidth problems that I'm having hopefully will go away. Uh, so, so if I just kind of start back from the top, so to give you a bit, a uh, bit of an introduction. Uh, so my name is Angus Moyer. Um, I lead the, the data collection transformation team um, here at the Bank of England, uh, which is a bit of a strange place, a bit of a strange job to lead. Uh, it's not exactly when you go to dinner parties, you can quickly explain uh, what it is you're doing and why it is you're doing it. And certainly wasn't what I envisioned, envisioned sorry, when, I, when, I, when I graduated from university and even when I joined the Bank of England. Um, but actually, if you follow my journey to get from where I started to where I am today, uh, it pretty much follows or, or is a bit of a story of, um, of actually, um, you know, why the bank cares about this. Um, and I started my life uh, at the bank as an analyst, um, uh, and I wrote papers and did analysis um, to help kind of senior policymakers within the bank uh, make good decisions, uh, and that was my job. Um, and I, I quickly realized that good analysis often, often wasn't down to um, really smart individual theoretical models, Often it was simply a question of having access to good data. Uh, and I also realized that we didn't have particularly good access to particularly good data, uh, and this was an issue for us. Um, and so when um, a, a project started to collect and improve um, some data uh, from the, the collection of data from some firms that, are, that I was partly responsible for supervising, uh, particularly UK clearinghouses and CCPs, um, I got involved in that project and I, and I had a, a pretty big role to play as part of that project. Um, and during that, that process, I, I definitely uh, felt that this was a useful exercise, but I also felt that it's something we could do uh, a lot better. Um, uh, and that got me into doing data collection uh, full time. Uh, and prior to, to my current job, I, I led, the, led the bank's involvement in a project called Digital Regulated Reporting uh, that we did in conjunction with the FCA and a number of financial firms. Uh, and it was really a great opportunity to uh, understand and innovate uh, and also to learn about other initiatives um, that are ongoing in this space, uh, things like Actus, uh, as is common domain model project, uh, FIBO and various other different uh, initiatives. Um, and I think that work um, and, and I guess the, 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 kind of the, the bank as well recognised that um, data collection was something that uh, we could do better, that we wanted to, to be better. Um, and that there were a number of initiatives that showed um, that, uh, you know, not just could we could do better and wanted to do, less, to, to do things better, but it was really kind of feasible and there was a, a general groundswell of support uh, for changing things and for, for making improvements in this space. Um, and so that led to uh, us launching uh, a review, uh, a review uh, called um, Transforming Data Collection from the UK Financial Sector that was launched um, with us publishing a discussion paper in January. Um, uh, and that review uh, is a pretty open review that basically asks the question, uh, how can we improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of data collection? Um, and so following us uh, publishing uh, that paper um, and drawing on the work uh, and the context and, and understandings and learnings we made uh, in digital regulatory reporting, um, we spent the first sort of six months uh, of this year discussing what are the problems with data collection um, and we spent a lot of the time as well uh, speaking and thinking about well, what actually um, are the solutions for data collection. Um, and one of the big problems that people identified was um, that for firms, 
um, getting hold of uh, and finding the information they need to supply us um, was a difficult exercise. Uh, and also for us to be able to communicate very clearly and very precisely about what data we wanted was also a, a very difficult exercise given the heterogeneity that we see uh, on, on the firm side. Um, and so there's a pretty much overriding consensus um, amongst us and amongst industry that um, developing some kind of common data standards that are across the industry um, is a key part of that solution. Um, uh, and I think we as an institution, we kind of institution, we, we felt that and we understood that. Um, uh, and it's certainly something which, you know, data standards are certainly something which we've, uh, we're interested in uh, and we see as important. Uh, and we played a big role in, in, in adopting and developing in the past. Uh, and things like the legal entity identifier uh, and, and the common data elements are things that the Bank of England has played and continues to play a big role um, in, in, uh, in developing. Um, and so then the question for us is, is almost sort of uh, understanding that data standards is important, but also saying, let's look to the future. How can we do more of this? Um, how can we do better? Uh, and, uh, and also particularly, um, what is our role in all of this? Um, and so before I, I pass back to, to Annie to continue uh, talking a bit more about this, um, perhaps I just start on some emerging thoughts and where we're going uh, with our view, uh, given that we think data standards are so critical um, to improving data collection. Um, so first is to say that we think the industry uh, and other participants play, have got a big role to play. Um, we as an institution uh, don't think that we have all the answers. Um, and we also think that to a certain extent, it's probably not our job to have all the answers. Um, our job is to kind of facilitate, uh, identify and corral people to make sure that the people who have the answers are in the right place uh, uh, and are there. Uh, and we can really just help um, the, the, the development and particular adoption um, of the solutions that, that other people potentially develop. Um, but before we do that, we need to help and we need to ensure that people understand um, what are the problems that we're trying to solve and in particular make sure we understand um, what the requirements are um, for these data standards and so we do want to play um, an important role in shaping and helping people understand um, what are uh, the requirements and what the problems that we want to solve. Um, and so I guess finally uh, this forum and forums like it um, that bring people together who have relevant knowledge um, who A can help us identify what the answers and solutions might be and B, that we can tell them uh, what we think are the problems, or at least what are requirements for these problems, are a really great opportunity for us to understand and to learn. Uh, and it's going to be critical um, not to do just throughout this year when we're doing our review, uh, not just to do throughout next year when we're starting to deliver um, some of the outcomes of this review, but certainly on an ongoing basis. Uh, and, and we're keen to continue the conversation uh, with people who are interested and have relevant views on this topic. Angus, thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, we could hear you loud and clear. That's perfect. Thank you very, very much. Okay, um, we're uh, pretty much exactly where we need to be in terms of uh, time um, and the schedule. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be inviting uh, Gavin to uh, speak. Um, Gavin's somebody I've got to know a little bit over the last few years. I'm very proud to say that Gavin's actually one of the advisors on the Transparency Task Force's advisory group. Um, Gavin is one of those very rare individuals who's incredible, absolutely incredible at bringing people together from all parts of the planet, quite literally, to focus on major, major industry challenges. And as I'm sure you'll have read from, um, from Gavin's CV or his bio rather on the websites on, on the program, he already has achieved many, many things in the data standard space and that's why i'm ever so pleased that gavin's been um, willing to participate to support and frankly to guide some of the conversation we're going to be having today so um without um, further delay i'm going to um, invite gavin to unmute and to speak when he's ready to and i believe that gavin's got some slides that you are very welcome gavin to uh, to start sharing now if you wish to uh, please don't rush, Gavin. I know you've got a lot of tremendous insight that you want to share. So perhaps feel free to uh, talk about your background, the, the music industry, what you've been doing in, in open open banking in the UK and around the world. Everything's going to be hyper relevant to what we're all collectively 
determined to try to achieve. So uh, Gavin Starks, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's great to meet everyone uh, and some familiar faces as well on, on the call as well. Um, as, uh, thanks for the introduction, Andy, as well. I think just to, to put a bit of framing around what I've been doing over the last 20 odd years has been to uh, try and work out basically how to get data sharing working. Uh, and I think we now frame this broadly under the category of what I call data infrastructure. Um, and so you're not just looking at me, I'll, I'll share some slides in a minute and just go through some top level um, ideas and kind of the vision piece that Andy was uh, alluding to, to frame some of our uh, conversation, but a bit, a bit of context, uh, first of all, and I'll just get, I'll get my sh uh, slides shared just so that we can test that that works. Can you see my slides okay? Are you seeing the main slide there? Let me know, Andy. You see it. We see it. Okay, great. Um, so the, uh, my background is uh, I've been setting up data-driven startups for uh, over 20 years now. Uh, uh, most recently, I created uh, co-created the Open Data Institute with Tim Berners-Lee and co-chaired the development of the Open Banking Standard, working uh, with uh, the whole of the banking uh, system and the FCA and so forth, and um, have been working with the FCA on extending that idea of open banking into open finance mm -hmm. and working with them on the uh, Climate Financial Risk Forum, uh, looking at how we might bring together some of the thinking around data sharing uh, into, into that realm. I'm now, I'll come back to what I'm doing now at the, at the end of this little session, but I want to just walk through uh, some concepts here. Uh, the main one is that we're trying to sustain over 7 billion people, probably 8 billion people now while we're hitting peak everything everywhere. And, and the, uh, the challenges to, to, to exist in a sustainable world are, are only increasing. Uh, and that touches on, on literally everything from healthcare to energy infrastructure, to transportation, to housing, as well as our sort of sustainable uh, economy. Oh, you seem presenter view. Okay, let me switch that around. Um, one second. How about that? Is that better? Okay, good. Um, so uh, trying to sustain uh, that level of, of um, economic development and maintaining jobs and thing, as all of this technology kind of comes along and, and sort of is generally disruptive to, to everyone. One of the ways, just again, going very high level here, how do we think about infrastructure? So we can think about our physical infrastructure as powering our, our goods economy, the physical goods economy, our internet infrastructure, um, thinking, uh, thinking there, that powers our digital economy. But on top of that, and, and I think we need to, to disaggregate here our sort of web uh, infrastructure from the content that, that flows across it, uh, what I call data infrastructure, powering our, our uh, knowledge economy. Uh, and so there's many, many uses, I can see in the comments there, you know, many uses for the same data. Uh, and the, the way that we've historically done things because we, we decided to get obsessed around uh, intellectual property and, uh, and, and um, make, keeping everything closed is how do we better share things without ending up with a million bilateral contracts individually negotiated. So part of my uh, objective here is to help us think about how we can build our data infrastructure. It's one of the strands that we kicked off in, uh, when I was at the Open Data Institute in 2013, and now is included in, a, in our national infrastructure plans. We have a data infrastructure plan, and today uh, government's actually announced its uh, consultation uh, on our data uh, infrastructure for the UK. Uh, and there's a critical kind of um, positioning here, which I'm, I'm really uh, obsessed about is data is not the new oil. I think it's the wrong analogy in, in lots and lots of different ways. Data is unlike most assets that we've typically modeled our economy on, is uh, we've basically modeled most of our economy on scarcity. Uh, and the, the data is the opposite of that. We have an abundance of data and the critical thing about it is if I give you a copy of it, I have a copy too. So it, it, it's the opposite of a normal physical asset. And, and so the way we measure value needs to shift uh, and here data increases in value the more it's connected. I think what, what we've seen over the last decade in particular is this kind of huge rush to do big data things. And I'd say, you know, I'd reflect maybe though we have lots of 
stagnant big data lakes uh, where people have invested in gathering the data, collecting it, putting it in one place, but we haven't necessarily invested in what to do with it or what problems are we trying to solve. So again, we've seen this pattern rinse and repeat, certainly over the duration of my career where the technology company is saying, you know, we've got the best thing ever, we, you should definitely use our tech. Lots of people wade into it, but not necessarily putting the user needs at the head of that question. So um, I think now we're also at a really interesting position of change. And I want to reflect now on what's different when we talk about this sort of idea of network thinking, how, if everything is connected, if we're in this digital uh, and data-driven economy, what can we learn from the past about what we got right and most importantly, what we got wrong and how can we make the most of it uh, going forward? Again, just reflection, these kind of provocations, everything, every age thinks it's the modern age. You know, if you go back a hundred years, we thought we were at the point of a technical or on the cusp of a technical utopia. Um, you know, the classic kind of IBM statements of you know, we, we think there's a global market for four or five computers. Um, we tend to underestimate, radically underestimate, uh, what uh, is coming and then the impact that it's going to have. And there's a lot of kind of futurologists that try and predict things, but in my experience, they're wildly incorrect because the implementation and the application of technology rarely meets its ambition. Uh, again, if you go back a hundred years, there was huge ambitions that radio and television would bring around uh, about world peace uh, because we'd have common education. You had the same rhetoric for the internet. I'd argue that we're maybe at a slightly different point. Um, and everyone thinks it's then. Um, and here, you know, again, reflecting the, the use of data, you know, the, the um, applications here, there's lots of utopian visions about what can happen. But quite often what we observe, because there's a, a fundamental mismatch between the commercial incentives and the state incentives, you know, looking after the, our citizens and looking after our macroeconomics and so on, are misaligned. And because companies can adapt so much more rapidly, uh, it's typically the citizens or the customers who, who, who lose out uh, in the end. Uh, and as an example of that, you know, just on personal data, um, you're starting to see these privacy policies around data popping up everywhere on televisions, uh, on fridges, uh, on receipts uh, that you get from supermarkets. Now, there's a massive gap here in understanding. Nobody reads these things, nobody cares about them. They just want to know, are we protected? So there's a huge role for regulation, a huge role for the state to say, we will sort this out. And GDPR goes some of the way to do this, uh, but it doesn't go all of the way uh, to do this. Um, and you, know, you end up with a massive imbalance of power. And there's a very um, good book here that talks about the negative consequences of, of this imbalance. Um, so there's a lot of negatives. And I think that as well, there's been a lot of focus on the negatives rather than the positives. Um, and there's a lot of, again, linked with this ambition, you know, AI will save us from something. Well, AI is not going to save us from anything because it's still going to be humans that implement this. Uh, and a good example of where artificial intelligence isn't is that the world's richest tech companies, and in fact, the world's richest person, um, st is still advertising to you things you've already bought on Amazon. So we could, we could sort of say that there's a revolution coming, but it's not quite here yet, or it's unevenly distributed, uh, or whatever the, the frame is. But the question that I'm spending most of my time on is, how do we make the most of this for everyone? You know, how, how do we um, talk to uh, consumers? How do we make the most of the question there of consumer data rights? And I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and where's agency in this? Are we just out of control? Is it too late? Or how do we rein back on, on some of the things that we've maybe let the horse out of the stable uh, a bit early? Uh, and now we're trying to play catch up. And GDPR in some ways is trying to play catch up. But I'd argue that open banking uh, is... Uh, a massive step forward. And it's one of the most exciting things I think I've worked on. Um, but let's also reflect here that now and more people online today than existed when I was born. Uh, so the, the human population has mushroomed and they're all online and there are more machines online than people. So we've got to start changing the way our, our thinking works uh, to be digital first. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is 
most organizations that I work with uh, or, and I have worked with, uh, and whether they're uh, multinational corporations or whether they're supranational bodies like the World Bank or the UN, their mental model about how to affect change is embedded in the physical systems of their organization. So the physical architecture of their building or the physical uh, architecture of their organizational charts, they're not digital native. They're not thinking digital first. And it's, it's a huge culture change to try and invert that to say, actually, the world is now porous, the world is now hyper-connected, but how do we embrace that in our strategic development? Um, and it's a massive shift uh, for, for organizations. And you know, uh, Andy asked me to talk about the music industry. I was involved, again, about, goodness, about 20 years ago in putting about a quarter of the world's music online. But you could reflect in the late 90s, you know, basically the music industry wanted to switch off the internet. Uh, please make it go away. You fast forward a, a few years and Apple came along and, and said, well, we're, we're just going to say that the cost of a track is a pound or a dollar. Um, and that created a marketplace. Uh, and the utility gradually, the, the, the utility that, that crept into the, the people's thinking was that you could get the product into people's hands. So you can make the point of sale it literally in someone's hand. They didn't have to go to a shop. And that's, that is a different mental model to say, well, we should create the biggest shop. You know, in the best case, you know, a, a big retail store like HMV or, or Virgin would hold about 60,000 products. You just can't compete when you've got uh, an online store with 10 million products and that shop is literally in your hand. Uh, and so the way of engaging around that completely shifted. But one of the design patterns that I thought was really interesting in helping an entire sector go into a digital first way of thinking is the ones who embraced it um, had a business. Um, but there was, you know, there's a point, a transition point, uh, if you like, a phase transition where I, I think people had to either embrace digital or go out of business. You know, you had, a, you had the opportunity to either embrace digital and see if you had a business in the future, because we didn't know at that time whether it would work, or ignore digital and go out of business. So it was quite a, not a great set of choices. Um, but what happened is the people who did succeeded and there was a burgeoning and thriving uh, music uh, marketplace now where the companies who adapted still are making good money. And uh, there's a diverse marketplace. In fact, it's increased in diversity. Um, and, and throughout that, actually the supply chain hasn't really changed. You've still got the same kinds of actors. You know, there was a lot of rhetoric about, oh, we can remove all the middlemen. Well, it turns out you need all the middlemen. You know, an artist is not a very good marketer. Uh, a marketer isn't very good at finance. You need different people in different countries. You need a distribution chain. You need a reporting chain. You need all of these different things in order to uh, maintain a global network. Um, and so you do need the artist, the record label, the distributor, the retailer in order to reach the consumer. And you can go direct to the consumer as well. And we worked with Radiohead uh, to demonstrate that at some scale uh, with their In Rainbows album for anyone who is old enough to remember that. Um, but I think it really struck me that the supply chain changed from physical to digital, but the roles didn't change. So you ended up with the same rough structure of ecosystem. But what we also did there was, was move from a, a situation where um, Lots of the, the retailers had their proprietary data formats. They were trying to do digital rights management and all of those kind of things. By the end of that process, we got rid of digital rights management broadly, and we'd standardized on what the data should look like. And that enabled then industry to reach more markets more quickly. And um, I want to talk now a little bit about the, the pace of change, because the pace of change is the thing that needs to terrify all of us and uh, probably does terrify all of us. If you look at the pace of change of something like Twitter, you know, they took several years to get to half a billion users. If you look at something like WhatsApp, uh, they have added a billion users in within three or four years. Yeah, that, that, so the speed to market of digital services and speed to market or, uh, and ability to connect, uh, linking back to my earlier point of data increases in value, the more it's connected. Once you're in a digital native environment, the ability to reach a billion customers is actually quite straightforward. And most terrifyingly, it happens much faster than an election cycle, and it happens faster than most regulators can inhale. So it's a really challenging um, uh, context and environment for the state 
to react to anything because laws take time to create. Um, roles take time, social norms take time to create, and we need to balance all of these out. And that's extremely uh, challenging. But I want to frame us here as like, this is still what I, uh, Ben Evans here calls the end of the beginning. You know, we've actually just connected everyone now. So we've got the internet, we've got smartphones, but we haven't really started in the, if you like, the applications. So if you think now after 25 years of doing all of this, we're, we're at the point now where we've started, we've got the baseline for connecting everyone. Um, and now is the time when we're going to really see this massive transition from uh, legacy industries to, um, to digital native industries. So I mentioned the music industry already, they didn't adapt fast enough. Um, Netflix and Amazon are the largest TV productions um, and YouTube games is bigger than Netflix. Uh, and actually, uh, if you look at it, Twitch now is more popular than HBO and ESPN, um, which again, there's all these demographics just sort of change uh, in, instantaneously. Um, you see the same thing in uh, other forms of supply chain. And I think interestingly in financial services, financial services are digital products. The fact that they, they're 20 years behind the music industry is kind of curious to me in some ways, uh, but they are digital native products. So as we move into an open banking and open insurance and, and so on, open finance world, we're going to start to see rapid uh, and very disruptive innovation uh, coming to market. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on, on the individual examples here, but we also have a, a strong legislative framework, mostly around the world, where there is either legislation or, or draft legislation. There's not many places left where we've got no legislation or, or no data uh, about what's going on. But we do have data protection laws in most countries and they are evolving. Um, and with, I really want to just focus a little bit on open banking, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And here what we have um, done is, is to effectively open banking to me, the reason it's so exciting is it isn't a technology project. Um, it does mandate a certain type of technology for usage, right? But that's not the important bit for me. The important bit for me is we actually aligned all of the regulatory framework into one way of operating across an entire sector that addressed consent, consent management, liability, liability transfer, the business rules, reciprocity and value exchange, and all of the rules of the market were agreed and has embraced uh, consumer data rights, has led to an open, federated and distributed free market and unlocks innovation. And for me, it's, it's really, it, it's, it really felt to me that the um, regulatory space, if you like, the, the business infrastructure and regulatory infrastructure caught up with the way that the internet works. So the, it, it codifies in a way that I haven't seen it in any other instance the way the web works and complements it with the rules-based structure that you must have in order to protect citizens and uh, protect businesses in the mix and that's what we're now doing so my next project and i'll just very briefly introduce what we're doing here um we're i've set up a, a new nonprofit called icebreaker1.org uh, and we're working on three major programs at the moment all of them are taking the principles and practice of open banking and applying them to new sectors. So one of the major projects we're working on is in energy, where we're building open energy to enable energy data sharing across the entire national grid with every provider. Uh, and that's a, a UK SBRI grant funded program. Uh, we're uh, currently in phase two of a competition. We've been shortlisted down to the two finalists at, at this stage. Uh, the second big program uh, is a standard for environmental risk and insurance. Uh, and there we're working with uh, Willis Towers Watson, with Aon, uh, Brit Insurance, uh, Arup, Cambridge University, to say how can we create climate ready insurance products so insurance products that drive behaviors towards net zero using this new data that's available. And the kind of thing that's different here is we've censored the world. So our companies like Arab cover infrastructure with sensors 
and we've got earth observation data, whole earth observation daily at roughly 30 centimeter resolution. That changes the game on a lot of different uh, dynamics. So that's the uh, environmental risk insurance. And the third piece which we've just announced is we're working with Edinburgh University and uh, University College Dublin to do economic modeling of how can we make our um, COVID economic recovery net zero. So there we're, we're doing city and regional analysis across the UK to look at how can we use whatever the stimulus uh, strategies are to deliver net zero rather than building back to where we were because then we'll, hit, we'll miss our uh, legally binding carbon targets. How can we use the data to drive decisions towards uh, net zero and reboot the economy? So overall here, I think you know, the, the, the message is there's a data infrastructure way of thinking which is focused on this data governance component that unlocks open marketplaces, but addresses intellectual property, ad addresses consumer data rights, and, and uh, addresses liability transfer. And we're right in the midst right now of working out what all of that means. So we're really keen to connect with anyone who is interested in, in this space. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Andy. Gavin, thank you very much indeed. You've set the scene so nicely. You've been able to talk about um, uh, standards in the energy space, in, in open finance, in banking, in music. You've really kind of helped to open all of our minds up to what the possibilities are. And you've shared some of the challenges as well. Um, some tremendous wisdom in your experience that I'm very, very keen that we all tap into and uh, find a way of sharing. Folks, uh, I hope everyone's okay with the, uh, the progress we've made so far. Um, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to start our first breakout group. Now, my colleague um, Alexandra has been working away at organising the breakout groups. Um, you'll be going into them in just a couple of minutes. Before I do, I would like to share with you some thoughts that were given to me by the guys at Actors. I'm, I'm making no secret here at all about the fact that I think that Actors has got a tremendous a potential and a lot to offer. I'm just being very, very open and very, very transparent about that. And um, what I'm going to do now is just share um, some thoughts about the potential, um, the potential talking points that we could use for some of the breakout sessions we're about to have. So let me just double check if I can pop that into the chat. It doesn't look like I can. So I'm going to, sp I'm going to speak to these points. So the sorts of talking points we might want to cover off during the session around the vision statement and the session around the problem statement relate to things like, you know, why does a regulator actually need to collect information? Um, what is meant by the term uh, granular financial data? Does it mean detailed analytical info or does it entail individual financial contract information? What's the appropriate level of granularity that will produce the optimal benefit. How does granular data support regulator directives on risk aggregation such as BCBS 239? What's the best way to generate the type of aggregated data needed for decision support and risk management from the account level of individual financial contract data? Uh, what are the trade-offs involved in data aggregation and how can those trade-offs be best managed? How can the work by an institution needed to develop regulatory requirements be applied as a net benefit to profitability and not just viewed as burdensome cost? How can Monte Carlo analytical techniques be applied to huge numbers of account level financial contracts? Three more. Um, what type and categories of information are needed for financial risk management and regulatory oversight in addition to detailed financial contract data? How would a pull system of regulatory collection of information from banks by regulators be best accomplished? The pull system idea is something that I personally find very, very attractive. It seems to have tremendous advantages. How does collecting granular data affect the estimated operating costs of financial institutions and the cost of regulatory oversight? Who benefits and how do they benefit from the, from the use of granular financial contract standards? Is it financial institutions? Is it regulators? Is it clients? Is it perhaps everybody? I'll put those points into the chat later on. But with a bit of luck, 
if everything's gone to plan, we're now going to be able to, um, we're now going to be able to invite everybody to join a breakout group. Uh, the breakout groups are going to last 20 minutes or so. And believe me, that time's going to go really quickly. Can I please invite everybody to participate as follows in the breakout group? Please make your points as succinctly as possible. Time is precious and everybody wants their chance to say what they want to say. So please be, uh, please be uh, polite in terms of how much time you're using. Please do respond to comments and questions as succinctly as you possibly can. Uh, be very honest, be very frank with each other, be very, be very blunt if necessary, but always be civilized, of course, and always be constructive as well. Now, we know that this 20 minute breakout session is not going to create any breakthrough eureka moments. This is not a technical deep dive into anything. We're just going to use the first session as a chance to start to get a feel for everybody's vision around what is going to be possible in the data standard space in financial services, particularly in relation to regulatory reporting. So please don't be frustrated that you haven't got the time to get into detail. Please don't get frustrated that you haven't got time to articulate anything with precision. It's just a case of understanding what the bullet points are and sharing those amongst each other. And of course, take the opportunity to make some really good contacts. I know within this group, we've got some very good old standing friends. We've also got many, many people who've never, never spoke to each other, met, never met before. So it's a great opportunity to, uh, to, to network. Okay, I'm going to invite my colleague Alexandra now to try to initiate the breakout groups. Within each of the breakout groups, there will be somebody from the FCA or the Bank of England hosting and facilitating. So please follow that person's lead. Thank you very much and please do enjoy your time in your breakout group. You'll need to accept the invitation on your, on your screen to join the breakout group that you've been invited into. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it interesting and engaging too. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, you've all been magically whisked back into the, uh, main, the main event, so to speak. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation in the breakout groups just now. I hope you found that uh, useful and informative. I also really hope you found one or two or even more uh, new good contacts. Uh, I do actively encourage you all to please use the chat to provide your contact details, your LinkedIn profile, your website. Let's do use this as a very, very good opportunity to network because or because it is. Okay, um, the next step in the process is going to be a 10 minute comfort break. Long enough to grab a cup of tea or coffee or something stronger if you fancy it. Um, after the break, we're going to have the, the breakout group's leaders share in very, very simplistic overview, bullet point format only, no time for detail. So we're going to have Martin Newley from the Bank of England, George Langston from the Financial Conduct Authority, Chris Brown also from the FCA, Andy Bill from the FCA and Angus from the Bank of England, providing very, very, very succinct feedback on what happened in breakout group one, which is all about the vision statement, what you could collectively see as being possible. Um, you remember I struggled to successfully copy paste into the chat some notes. I, I've continued to struggle to do that. However, the good news is I've figured out how we can actually add a document to the chat. So um, I'm now going to be adding a file from my computer. And this file from my computer is simply just talking points. Some of these you may have already uh, spoken to. Some of them may be relevant for the problem statement session. And in a moment, my colleague Alexandra is also going to put a document into the chat, which will be a list of who's involved in today's session, first name, surname, um, job title, organization, etc. Okay, now I will be um, back in just a couple of minutes, even though we'll be uh, having a 10 minute break. Uh, and that means if anybody wants to have a kind of uh, an informal conversation with me during the break, you're very welcome to do so. So the time is now 23 minutes past the hour. Which hour doesn't matter because you're all in different parts of the world, but 23 minutes past the hour. Uh, please reconvene at 33 minutes past the hour. You've got 10 minutes to do whatever you want. Entirely up to you. I hope everyone's okay. Thank you so far. Please be ready to reconvene fresh 
at uh, 33 minutes past the hour. Thank you very much indeed. I am here and can hear if anybody wants to say or ask anything, please far away. Well, Andy, we managed to solve the problems of the world in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure any group with you in it, Jeff, no, would have no, no. surprised it took no, you 20 no. minutes. No, and it was, it was really a challenge. And we, we, it was it, being whisked back to the main session in the middle of conversation was a bit like we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. From, uh, <laughs> I know. You know. <laughs> I, I can imagine. I, I very nearly, and I'm glad I did, I nearly stopped myself from um, thinking of a different way of explaining the same point when you're halfway through something you can't really stop. I, I get your point entirely. All we're trying to do today, Jeff, is make connections, get the ball rolling. There'll be ample opportunity to get into more conversation. The very fact that you all wanted to come and speaking is, is the encouraging thing. It really is. Wonderful. We're pretty much bang on schedule. So thank you all very much for allowing me to kind of corral you as the way I am doing today. Um, second time that word's been used, corralling. Gavin used corralling when he talked about corralling participants around the world to focus on what needs to be focused on. And I think that's a good word for what we are trying to do. We're trying to corral the individuals, the energy, the ideas, the insight, the experience into a very, very worthwhile cause which is all about stripping away the, and getting rid of the unnecessary friction in the system that is holding back the financial services sector from serving society as best as it can. I, I spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago and I said to them, do you remember when you were a young driver? In other words, not a very experienced driver. You would occasionally drive off in your car, but within a few moments, perhaps a minute or so, realize that you've got the handbrake on. And you think, oh God, I've got the handbrake on. And you let go of the handbrake and you suddenly you know, lurch forward now that you're moving forward in a far more efficient way. The, the way I kind of see it is like this. The financial services sector is operating with its handbrake on. And more and more of us are realizing that the handbrake is causing wholly unnecessary, unwanted friction. And we want to get rid of it. We want to turn that handbrake off. We want to move forward with wheels that spin nicely and freely. And that's what data standards can do. Data standards can act as a, a lubricant in the system. And my goodness me, the rather brain damaging time I had working with others to try to get a relatively simple, straightforward standard sorted out for the pensions and payroll industry has absolutely convinced me that there's enormous opportunity to do something really, really worthwhile in this space. And that's what we can do together. I'm now going to invite our, our colleagues from the Bank of England and the FCA to share as succinctly as humanly possible uh, the feedback from the sessions that they uh, facilitated in chairs. We're going to go to Mr. Martin Udy first of all. So Martin, in two minutes or less, please, just give us the key points that came out from your session, Martin. And of course, just start off with a very, very brief introduction to yourself uh, Martin, you'll need to unmute yourself and then share with us all your thoughts, please. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Martin, I work with Angus at the bank on the data transformation project, data collection transformation project uh, with main focus on liaising with external stakeholders, trying to make sure we're talking to the, the right people at the right time about the right things. So obviously with, with sort of limited time in the session, we did some introductions and then we got on to starting to talk about what some people thought were the key issues. Um, started off with, with, you know, suggestion data standards are effectively the basis of, of risk management. And it's really key to, to maintain the DNA of the original data in terms of how people use the data. So dashboards, you know, should be focused rather than having lots of different data of different color. The, we would then went on to talk about the importance of defining data in a digital way. And, and this sort of reflects what, what we've heard as well in discussions with firms that it's really about defining data in a granular way, making it clear for everybody what the definitions of data are and how those data might be used in creating other data so that everybody understands how the data is calculated. So, you know, a very important and, and, and uh, correct suggestion that, that 
that what's holding people back really is that nobody wants to dig into the plumbing as it exists because there's been a lot of additions to the to the plumbing over the years and it's not uh, it's not an easy process but that, that really the key to addressing that is to is to get the CEOs on board and that they they perhaps don't realize the importance of the issues and what the issues are uh, and and to get them on board you know hopefully it wouldn't take another crisis but there needs to be something that forces change and forces that uh, that CEO involvement and then just sort of finishing off you know I think a, a really important point that in many ways you know some companies the most successful companies have collected data without really knowing how they're going to use it sort of just making sure they've got as much data as possible and then worked out how to use it in an effective way and certainly some of what came through in the work that, that we've been doing at the bank you know is is that change is the expensive thing and if we can make sure that we're collecting the right amount of data in the right way from the start then there should need should be less need for change and so we shouldn't be afraid of collecting more data than we need to make sure that when we have crises and things we can respond more effectively Martin, thank you. Um, just checking in with you, Martin, have you got to the end of your list of bullet points? Yeah. Fantastic. That was very timely and very efficient. Martin, thank you ever so much. Wonderful. Uh, if I can invite you, please, Martin, just to sort of write up those notes, if you don't mind, just very briefly as bullet points and whack them into the chat before we finish the session today. That will be extremely helpful, Martin. Thank you. Sure. We're now going to go straight to George Langston from the FCA. Uh, George, please briefly introduce yourself and then run us through the bullet points from your group. Thank you, George. Of course, get yourself off, off mute first of all. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Andy. So, yeah, I'm George Langston and I work in the Digital Regulatory Reporting Project at the FCA, uh, which is aimed to maximise the usefulness of the data we receive whilst minimising the burden on firms uh, to submit it to us. Uh, so, yes, in terms of the conversation, we had really, really good conversation, I think. Uh, we had, uh, in terms of uh, the ultimate destination we want to work towards, we established, um, or at least discussed, four overarching general necessary criteria. Uh, the first was this, uh, was that standards should ideally be cross-jurisdictional and global, rather than being set unilaterally. Uh, this should be implicit probably uh, as an ultimate destination and uh, could even be spurred on more if it was promoted or had the involvement of global institutions like the FSB. The second point uh, or criteria is that standards, particularly if they are global, they need to work for smaller firms, which are you know, overwhelmingly based in only one jurisdiction, uh, just as much as they work for multinationals, which are obviously based across jurisdictionally. Third, the data uh, should be collected for necessary purposes, as uh, sometimes there's an impression that regulators collect data for its own sake. I couldn't possibly comment on that. And uh, fourthly, it should uh, tackle bias uh, and discrimination uh, caused by the data in its design phase. Um, and then I think uh, we did have, in terms of, um, of a hypothetical ideal solution, one was, uh, one was put forward by Willie Bramett, and I will almost certainly you need know, to describe it in the wrong way, but from my very limited understanding off of a very short conversation, it envisaged eliminating 90% of the costs um, on firms to supply the data to regulators without actually having to ensure consistency across all firms' underlying data standards. Um, based on the fact that banks often already use underlying standards um, for flow processes and other things, and uh, regulators should be able to just pull this data out when they need it using APIs or some other method. And that's everything we discussed. Uh, that was such a well-structured uh, feedback, uh, George. That could have been a training session. Thank you so much. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. I particularly like the point whoever made it in your group about the need for a kind of a global international perspective. Trying to do data standards on a national basis is just, it's just futile, you know. Um, I quickly realised when running the Transparency Task Force that trying to drive, drive reform in just the UK was, was meaningless because it's a global ecosystem. So I, I'm particularly grateful to whoever made that particular point that you articulated so nicely. Thank you very much indeed, George. We're now going to go to one of your colleagues and forgive me because I've lost my list here. Um, one of your FCA colleagues, I think it might be Chris. Is it Chris Brown? Chris, it's over to you. Yeah, please. I think I was group three. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. So um, 
uh, we, yeah, we had some really interesting discussions in our group, and uh, we, we only wish we had a, a little bit more time to continue and continue them on. But um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Chris. I'm in uh, Andy and George's team at the FCA, working on digital regulatory reporting. Um, so we we had some really interesting subjects come up, um, and the 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 discussion really centred around. So um, we need to we need to question why we're collecting the data in the first place and whether this is an ambitious enough goal. So uh, we, we really looked into some of the challenges that firms are facing. So do firms ever actually use the, use the regulatory reports that they submit to understand their business? Um, we, we think that um, there's very minimal examples of that in an industry. So there, there's a sort of clear communication gap between the, the regulatory intent um, and what um, and what firms understand and how uh, and the data that they supply back to us as regulators. So, um, one of the one of the challenges would be how do we how do we close that gap and how do we create a regulatory reporting infrastructure whereby the data that firms are supplying is actually valuable to them as an institution and not just us as the regulator. And also questioning whether the data that we collect currently is actually useful to the regulator in the first place. So that's a whole a whole nother question. Um, the, going down, we, we had some really interesting questions. Um, a couple of highlights were um, uh, we need to form a, a group, uh, a group that um, uh, gives trust to the marketplace on, first of all, what data we're collecting and how it's used. Um, some specific examples were the Open Banking Initiative. Um, we realise it's been a very big, challenging project to implement, but that organisation by the sort of single trusted or uh, single trusted place for all that data to be uh, all that data to be um, used in the industry. So um, that was quite an interesting example. Um, due to time, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. But I've drafted drafted some notes and and summarised them in the group chat. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Perfect stuff. Absolutely perfect. Uh, I really appreciate everyone allowing me to make sure that we run to time so well. So that's fantastic of you all to be so succinct. We'll now go to Andy Beal. Andy at the FCA, please share us the key, share with us rather the key points from your group, please, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just sort of be pretty brief. We had a, a good discussion, same as everybody else. But um, so we came up with uh, a sort of a vision statement, something like. Uh, is creation of a shared or common language which enables different operators and stakeholders to openly communicate without friction. Wow. So that, that was sort of some sort of intent. Uh, and then the sort of principle, you know, things that, you know, this, this enables, you know, the key design principles is that there would have to be sort of semantic precision. Uh, so it's sort of commonly understood and it's very precise. Uh, it's granular. Um, it's simple. Uh, delivers benefits for all and uh, another key attribute would be that you'd leverage existing standards where possible and then just basically trying to make them more universal um, so you know that might be more on the sort of the way you start and where you go with it but um, to build on the point there are lots of things that are e existing so it's I suppose the really interesting thing around all of this will be governance and how that <laughs> how that works but uh yeah those are the key points andy super succinct thank you ever so much i uh i love the phrases and some of the language there semantic precision that's so important that was the bit that gave us brain damage with the uh the data standard i was involved with the amount of arguing and discussions and heated conversations about the exact language to use and the exact terminology to use it really did take up a lot of time but we got through it in the end so i understand the exact point being made there about semantic precision thank you very very much indeed last but by no means least we go straight to angus angus over to you uh thanks andy uh, so we spent uh, a bit of time uh or most of our time talking a bit more about what the, the vision is for and what outcomes ultimately uh we want to deliver um you know, as part of this, this process um and i guess the focus was uh, on the consumer and, and the kind of the, the financial services that the financial system provides uh, and trying to make sure that um, ultimately those financial services are, are value for money um, uh, and that consumers are, are, are informed and have control to make good decisions um, uh, when they're, they're purchasing financial services. Um, uh, and within that, we talked a bit more about uh, as well, consumers need the control 
um, uh, about how their data is used uh, and to make sure that um, their, the correct access rights to make sure that um, consumers uh, not only uh, have control about how the data is used, but that those controls are actually in place and they're working properly. Um, and I guess the third thing we talked a bit about, um, we started a discussion around semantics and linguistics in finance, um, but I certainly think that's probably not a topic for a longer conversation, and I couldn't really summarise that uh, in, in 30 seconds, so I'll leave that for another day. Angus, thank you uh, very, very much indeed. Again, wonderfully concise, wonderfully efficient. And if you don't mind, please, Angus, Andy, and all your colleagues, please do, if you haven't already, pop your notes into the chat so we can circulate widely. widely rather. Um, I noticed lots of folks have put their contact details into the chat. I encourage you all to do that. It's just going to help everyone to connect and leverage each other's capabilities as effectively as possible. Okay, we're pretty much uh, bang on target time-wise, which is cool. The next piece of this jigsaw that we're building today is uh, breakout group number two. And breakout group number two is to focus on the problems, okay? We've looked at, uh, we've taken the perspective of what does the vision look like? Please focus your attention now on the problems, the issues to be overcome, uh, what's getting in the way. And of course, continue to speak freely, openly, uh, in a very, very constructive way. I I'm getting a good vibe from everyone's participation already. So I'm going to invite my colleague, Alexandra, to once again, open the same breakout groups. There'll be ample opportunity to work with people in other breakout groups in due course, but for today, we're going to keep everyone in the same sessions so you can get some camaraderie going, which is a nice thing to do. Um, so please do invite, sorry, please do join the breakout group that you've just been invited to on your screen. Again, we're going to be running this for 20 minutes or so. Then after that, we've got the feedback. And then after that, we've got Alan Mendelowitz talking about his insights on these very important issues. Thank you. Please do join your group now. Thank you. Uh, so the focus of this one is on the challenges in, in delivering this and, and vision. Yeah, that's exactly right. The problem side of the equation. That's exactly right. The challenges to put it. Thank you very much, Andy. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you again for uh, successfully completing the breakout session. We're going to go straight now to Martin, then George, then Chris, then Andy, then Angus for their very succinct overview of the problems and the challenges and the obstacles that you have all just been speaking. So um, we're going to go straight to Martin. Martin, please unmute yourself and um, start your feedback. Thank you. Hello, Martin. We may have temporarily lost Martin. Let's go from Martin to George. George, are you there? If so, start speaking, please. Thank you. I am there, but I um, haven't had time to simplify um, any of our discussions. So uh, this will be, yes, quite rambling. I think uh, one of the things we, we thought about was obviously the natural problem is cost, how much it's going to cost. Uh, another problem which uh, came towards the end of our conversation is that because technology and just financial services in general is developing so fast, it could be the case that we invest a lot right now into something which is basically irrelevant by the time it's been ends up being developed. Um, we, there's another potential risk uh, that was um, spoken about in terms of regulators and um, concerns about regulators being uh, interested in data standardization from quite a narrow uh, perspective, such as purely delivering regulated reports when data standardization has a lot more potential in many other ways. Uh, another thing is we can't consider data standards um, on its own without also thinking about algorithms. And I think those are the four points that off the top of my head, I think uh, I can pull out right now. George, despite the fact you had like microseconds to repair it, that was a very coherent uh, set of thoughts. Thank you very much indeed, George. We'll see if we can go, we're going to go now to Chris, and then Andy, then Angus, and if he's with us, Martin, at the end of that. So uh, uh, Chris, over to you, please. Thank you. No problem at all. So let me just pull my notes up. Here we go. Yeah. So, um, and again, another really good discussion. Um, uh, some of the key themes that came out of this one uh, were around um, businesses um, have a, a sort of lack of understanding of how the data fulfills specific business goals. Um, there's some disparity in how models uh, function across industry. 
where you have um, situations where firms themselves may have multiple different models and in between different firms they, they may have multiple different models for a specific uh, specific purpose. The example we looked at was, uh, was around financial cash, cash flow models um, and it was really raised that um, a lot of the discrepancies were around a lack of understanding in how the models are, models are functioning, whether it's an error in the programming or whether it's a sort of fundamental uh, fundamental error in how the model is functioning. So a single clear model for the industry uh, would, would be something that would help overcome one of these problems. Um, we then went on and we, we had a really good example of some of the communication challenges that often go on when, when you're developing any products in this area, um, particularly around um, an example from open banking where um, you had a group of uh, technologists and policy makers put into a room together um, and you obviously had a situation where the technologists were, were pushing towards the, the most innovative solution, not taking yeah. away from the concerns of policymakers and vice versa. So I think it really highlights some of the communication challenges that exist on an everyday basis across uh, multiple different um, elements of work. And from there, we, we had a bit of a chat about um, a real need to focus on maintaining a clarity of thought uh, in, in the actions. Um, there, this really sort of acts to build trust in, in the marketplace and the sector. Um, finally, moving on to the last couple of bits, um, we, we had a discussion around what some of the specific issues are around why this hasn't been implemented before. Some of these were around competition issues in the marketplace. So a single vendor uh, building a proprietary solution could lead to sort of monopoly-esque behaviours. Um, so open source was seen as a, as a really good way, to, way for this to go. Um, we talked about sustainable sourcing of open source products. So whether you need a revenue model to go in and support open source standard development. Um, and we had some interesting discussions about how open banking have gone on to, to do something similar there. Um, I think that's about, that's about everything we got through. Chris, absolutely fantastic. Well, that group clearly had uh, a lot of very uh, constructive dialogue. Thank you very much, Chris. Straight now to... Uh, to Andy. In fact, just before Andy goes, I saw a note from uh, Gavin. It says something like, sorry for spamming with all, these inf all this information. Please, please, please do not worry about how much you're sharing in the chat. It's all going to be useful content. It's all clay on the wheel, as it were. So please, I encourage all of you to get as much into the chat as you wish. and No need to apologize for how much you can contribute. On the contrary, please contribute all you've got. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. So straight now to uh, Andy at the FCA. Thank you, Andy. Hi, yeah. Um, so I, I'll just go, uh, and I'm sure I could group these really well uh, if I really thought about it, but I haven't. Um, so <laughs> in, in no particular order, I think that the key thing was that, you know, at the beginning, there's sort of a, uh, obviously a sort of the legacy that there is there, all the competing standards, what existing individual organizations are already doing, the existing protocols, Therefore, this idea that um, there's going to be some sort of, there will definitely be some resistance to re-engineer anything about the existing legacy position. And there's a lack of clarity on what the benefits are going to be from actually doing it. Can, can you actually get those benefits within a reasonable time scale? Um, and, and I think linked to that, there's this, there's this thing that there needs to be some, it's not a one-off, it needs a long-term commitment. It needs trust that actually people are going to stick with it, that it's going to have long-term governance, long-term impact. So you can perhaps start off with some, you've got to therefore start off with something to build momentum and then, then build. Um, so it needs that long-term commitment, it needs trust. Uh, and it's, it's also saying it's not, it's not easy. Um, it needs drive, incentive, you know, appropriate carrot and sticks. Where things have failed, it hasn't had that sort of effective governance. Um, and there hasn't been that sort of count and stick approach. And, uh, you know, there are, there are obviously, and in financial services, um, they're, they're apparently, not that I was working in financial services back then, but there, there is a track record a few years ago of uh, a, an initiative around data standards, which was uh, UK and, and the US, I believe, which uh, ground to a halt for, for various reasons which we haven't got into yet. But clearly we'd want to learn the lessons of why that didn't work. Um, yeah, and so it's la la lack of sort of final two things then is clarity on who's holding liability of, of these of these sort of things if things go wrong, um, and, and the final part really around trust that this is a journey that stakeholders want to go on. It's worthwhile putting time into 
Um, I think there are too many times where people start off the, everybody's got good intent with these sorts of initiatives, all sorts of bilateral agreements are created, but the value isn't seen, it takes too long, people get bored of it, and, and it's got to build, it's got to build momentum uh, and, and, and trust that it will continue to deliver value. So I think, I think you've got to start off with things that are going to see and feel value for, for important stakeholders very quickly. Andy, thank you very much indeed. There's um, lots and lots of wonderful wisdom in the comments that you just shared with us. Thank you. Let's go to Angus. Uh, Angus, feel free to uh, share your thoughts from your group. Thank you. Angus, you don't seem to be on mute, so perhaps your volume's down somehow. No, no, Angus is on mute. He needs to unmute. Is he? I can see two Anguses then. There seems to be the Angus on the phone and there's the Angus on the screen. What we'll do is we'll go straight back to Martin, who I know is with us. Martin, over to you, please, to share your thoughts. And then we'll try to patch back into Angus. Martin. Ah, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Thank you. Great. So, so yes, we um, we had a pretty good discussion. There was um, a, a sort of a lot of reflection on a lot of effort having been spent, you know, over a long period of time. And the expression used was sort of trying to boil the ocean. You know, this just hadn't worked, and that we needed to take a much more sort of specific approach, um, potentially by types of firms. Um, and there were sort of mixed views on that or potentially by sort of specific product areas. There was a suggestion that uh, central clearing counterparties could play a role and that the Bank of England could be in a, a good position to, to sort of initiate that work. Uh, there was a suggestion that common data models would take a long time and that semantic, uh, a semantic approach could be the, could be the key but that whatever we do, it, it's really important to do small steps and that we need a clear vision of what those initial practical steps are that people can, can buy into and see that, that something really can be achieved in a, in a, in a, a reasonably short time scale. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, that's great. And I think we've got um, Angus back. Uh, Angus, are you ready to speak? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can. Thank you very much, Angus. Over to you. Great. So we mainly focused on what you might think are the people aspects of the problem. Uh, so we spent a lot of time talking about incentives uh, for people to change. Uh, and there was a bit of a disagreement, I think, about to what extent um, legacy providers uh, had little incentive to change. And that was kind of a big cause of uh, the problems that we see. Uh, we also spent quite a bit of time talking about culture as well, thinking about people um, and the differences in, in cultures and communities and the fact that they speak different languages. Um, so and this could be between different business areas, between risk and operations, for instance. Um, or it could be um, between, let's say, technical technology people uh, and, and business managers um, and how these, uh, therefore, maybe we need some kind of uh, interoperability um, between the different languages that communities speak. Uh, we spoke a bit about um, how we might deliver change, and in particular, when we're talking about standards, um, it have been critical to understand what level we standardise at. Uh, and finally, we talked a little bit about the approach for getting from where we are today um, to uh, where we want to be, um, with an emphasis that the approach is important, and again, kind of recurring, uh, re-emphasising similar themes uh, that we heard elsewhere around perhaps starting small and growing incrementally. Angus, thank you very much indeed. Now. Um... I think we've had some wonderful feedback from some great breakout sessions. I'm going to invite the uh, folks at the Bank of England and the FCA to work with me to try to bring all this information together and perhaps capture it as a single overview document that we can share with all the participants. I think that'll be useful. I can see Sue Milton nodding away quite quite positively to that there. It's going to take us a bit of time and effort to do it, but it's not, you know, it's not going to be too difficult. We, we can get that done one way or another. And if necessary, I'll happily take on the task myself if, if I have to. Um, wonderful. OK, I'm now going to invite Alan Mendelovitz to spend perhaps 10 minutes or, or thereabouts sharing with us his thoughts and his insights. So, Angus, you'll be speaking, sorry, Alan, you'll be speaking in just a moment. 
Um, whilst Alan's preparing himself uh, to speak, I just want to say this. Um, I've got to know Alan and his colleagues actors pretty well over the last year, year and a half or so. And I can honestly tell everybody there is an extremely authentic enthusiasm for the possibilities that their approach to data standards provides. There is a very, very genuine uh, purposefulness and mission type mindset around what these guys uh, are doing. And it's absolutely fantastic. And quite frankly, the session we're having today would not be happening if it wasn't for Alan and Willie and Jeff at Actus. And I'm extremely grateful to them for opening my mind up about the possibilities that actors can provide and for energizing me with their enthusiasm. Um, you know, uh, enthusiasm is a pretty infectious thing. So Alan, thank you so much for being the way that you are with all of this stuff. Uh, Alan, over to you. Thank you very much. Andy, thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, call up the uh, slides here if I can uh, find, uh, great, if I can find them, just one second. Um, here we go. Uh, this looks like it. Here we go. Perfect. Adam. Well done. Okay. Is this, um, oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Okay. Just one second. Can you, can you see the lead slide there or, uh, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Ellen, we see it, yeah. but we see the present presenter mode. Maybe okay. you can okay. go Yeah, in. I'll, uh, I'll switch. Okay. Um, okay. There we go. Can you see that? And I've got a view to presenter mode and slideshow. Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, Andy, thank you so much. I think that what distinguishes uh, the presentation today and adds on to the presentation that we made earlier were two things. One, Gavin talked about uh, how to share information and Hello. what we're talking about in this presentation is what should be shared. This is he speaking, yes. How can I help you? Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, I really want to uh, okay. well, take the issue of some uh, terminology and uh, I would like to um, basically try to encourage everyone to think about standards in the context of finance, financial regulation I, I do. in terms of a, a financial contract standard as opposed uh, to a data can standard. You, can you, can you call me uh, David Plaksikowski, please, uh, please uh, mute. David, you need to mute. Okay, good. Anyway, so as I said, um, I'm starting my presentation now. Uh, we should be thinking about uh, a financial contract standard as opposed to a data standard. And the reason for that is that data standards are the terminology used when people talk about the terms of financial contracts. And the uh, presentation I'm going to make today revolves around uh, the issue of what I learned and the journey I took from becoming a regulator to being intimately involved with the ACTA standard. The, um, why is this not moving? Okay, um, I'm going to uh, go back to, uh, uh, somehow this is not moving. Uh, escape, 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 escape. Um, uh, uh, Alan, there is an arrow. There was an arrow on, at the bottom left. Yeah, um, uh, yeah on the bottom uh, left of the screen. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, yeah, okay. no yeah. problem. Okay. So the four areas uh, I'm going to uh, cover today are what's the problem, what are the goals for transform regulatory reporting, thinking about how to achieve those goals, and the contribution that we think we can make with the Act of Standard. The, uh, I headed a financial regulatory agency overseeing a system of banks with a combined balance sheet of a trillion dollars. And back in the day, a trillion dollars was a lot of money. 
I expected that we would get the same kind of data, the same analytics as a regulator that were being used to manage the bank and understand the banks in terms of their uh, uh, running their business and managing their risk. What I found was the information we collected the reports that were dated, static, backwards looking, and they didn't provide timely insights into the condition and vulnerabilities of the regulated firms. Secondly, the regulatory reports imposed significant costs on the banks we regulated. And despite that, we did not get real time insights into the condition of the banks and how they could change when the state of the world changes. I talked to some of the uh, CEOs of the banks we regulated and I said, listen, do you guys ever use uh, the regulatory reports that you send to us to understand the risk of your on your balance sheet or to manage your business. And when they stopped laughing, I realized really how uh, uh, fruitless an effort this was. And so uh, what are the, um, um, uh, so uh, what are the goals of reforming the uh, system? Well, one is we want to provide regulators with current forward-looking information about the condition and vulnerabilities of regulated financial institutions. We want to reduce the regulatory burden. At the same time, we want to make it easier for regulators to review, understand, and act on the information provided by the banks. And next, provide sufficient additional benefits, and this is critical to financial firms so they can enthusiastically support reform efforts. You know, uh, one other example of that is the improved timeliness, accuracy, and consistency of the data that the banks would supply to regulators can be used by senior bank management so that it's a real win-win situation. So what are the requirements to achieve this goal? One is that um, we recognize that the analysis of all critical indicators of the fiscal condition and health of a bank, such as capital, income, value, debt, liquidity, all start from the same point. And that same point are the payment obligations and expected cash flows for each individual financial contract. And the, this point can't be uh, overstated. The importance of this point cannot be overstated because all analysis in a financial institution starts out with the cash flows of the individual financial instruments, the granular data, the individual contracts, and then get aggregated up. Performing such analysis requires knowing and the ability to collect the specific terms and conditions of individual financial contracts that determine the cash flows. And it requires a standard of the fundamental algorithms that combine with the contract terms that are necessary to generate the cash flows at the granular level of the con granular contract level, which are in fact the uh, starting point for all operations and analysis. So what are the enablers of uh, this reform system that we'd like to achieve? Well, we need unambiguous definitions of the complete common, uh, the set of common financial terms, such as um, uh, immaturity, payment cycles, resets, et cetera, combined with the functional specification of the algorithms that generate the cash flow. You can't get to where we want to get without having both. The algorithms that represent the logic of the contracts combined with the standard for the contract terms. Second, as amazing as it may sound, is such a standard is actually doable and achievable because despite the myriad thousands of different financial contracts and instruments that are out there in the market, if you focus on the promised cash flow, the promised payment obligations, it turns out there's a very limited number of cash flow patterns. And it's that underlying observation that makes it possible to come up with a reasonable and deployable financial contract standard. Um, third, uh, the advances in information technology, high performance computing, uh, bandwidth, uh, broadband connections around the world, cheap storage, make it possible to work with large numbers uh, of large data sets uh, and collect large data sets and analyze large data sets. And in order to make all of this work, you absolutely need to have a royalty free open source standard because there'll be pushback on any proprietary solution that will inhibit the ability to uh, deploy the standard. So um, 
what is uh, our contribution is we've come up with a standard that in fact reflects both the required components and the enablers. The ACTA standard includes a data dictionary of contract terms, uh, uh, technical specifications of the contract types, which are the limited number of cash flow patterns we talked about, and an open source free reference implementation in Java of the al algorithmic ACTA's contract types. And together, they produce the uh, promised payment obligations required for all analyses. Uh, as I said, the ACTA standard is uh, open source and is free. Collecting and mapping data into the ACTA standard can transform regulatory reporting, give regulators the ability to rapidly perform current and forward-looking analysis, and support seamlessly moving between contract level views and aggregated results to any level of aggregation that you choose to go to. And the beauty of it is that it gives the banks a way forward to reduce the costs and the burden of not only regulatory reporting, but excessive operational costs that are associated with the morass that bank data is in today. And on top of this, it produces uh, the, uh, the ACTUS uh, standard contributes to a su substantial expansion of transparency in markets by clearly identifying what the payment obligations are in the contracts that underline all of the financial business. And lastly, on this point, I think uh, once you've mapped into the ACTUS standard, it's probably the last mapping you will ever have to do because it insulates the bank from uh, future, future requirements and future compliance costs. I mean, stated very simply, uh, this is what it represents. The financial contract standard has terms for the contracts and algorithms, and together they generate the cash flows. Uh, going back to the uh, uh, observation that was made earlier in the discussion about uh, what underlies action, I think uh, this uh, 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 pyramid sort of captures it. You have data, you interpret the data, it gets you information, you analyze the information, it gives you knowledge, and only then are you in a position to take action, whether that action is managing your business or providing regulatory oversight for uh, the, um, uh, the world. I'm sorry, for the financial world. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That's our presentation. And uh, we are um, happy to be here and happy to uh, uh, be a part of these discussions and delighted to have the opportunity to talk about what we think is an important contribution to improving the situation for both regulatory oversight and the compliance costs that go along with it. Um, very, very much indeed. And I think my colleague Alexandra might be able to uh, stop the uh, screen sharing at the okay. top. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did it. I did it. I got cool. it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But no, very good indeed. Excellent. You managed to squeeze a lot in a very short period of time. I, I think I'm right in saying that the folks at Actus will be happy to um, elaborate on the presentation that's just been given. If you'd like Alan and or Willie and or Jeff to present Actus to you online through a Zoom chat, for example, then please just pop a note into the chat and invite them to, uh, to connect with you and do that. Okay, wonderful. So we've spoken so far about the overall idea that there's too much friction, there's too much risk, there's too much complexity in the system. We've talked about the idea that as well as there being technical challenges, there are also human challenges, the people bit, you know, getting people to want to work together and collaborate. We've also spoken about the idea that there is a common good here that could benefit everybody. And I've used that rather simple analogy that at the moment, it's like the financial services sector is a vehicle being driven around with its handbrake lodged on. Yeah, that handbrake is causing unnecessary cost, unnecessary risk, too much friction in the system. And it's in all of our interests to find ways to turn that handbrake off. We spent a bit of time talking about the vision statement. In other words, we've described what the future could look like. Some of that future is before the horizon, some of it on the horizon and some of it even beyond it. And we've hopefully not constrained our thinking too much about what is actually possible. And of course, we've had the nitty gritty conversations about um, the realities of where we are now and the things getting in the way. In terms of process moving forward, for the next 24 minutes or so, we'll have the formal rest of this conversation. 
But at the top of the hour, we've then got another half hour for anybody that wants it for what we describe as our five side chat, which is very informal, ongoing dialogue. If you want to stay around for that, then please do. You're very welcome. If you need to dash off at the top of the hour, of course, that's good as well. Whatever works for you. We'll fill up with email. We'll make sure we build on the momentum that you've managed to create today. And either myself personally or preferably working with the folks at the Bank of England and the FCA will turn everything in the chat into some coherent document that we can all share and make use of. So here we go. We get to the, uh, the kind of semi-structured bit um, around, um, around the discussion. So we're going to need to manage this because we have so many people with us today. So I will invite you simply to raise your hand or wave a hand if you wish to make a point, ask a question, whatever suits you. I'll invite you please to keep your questions and comments reasonably short so that we can give everybody a chance to say what they'd like to say. But remember, if we run out of time at four o'clock, so at the top of the hour, we've got some far side chat time after that. So, um, limber up, who'd like to uh, start us off with the Q&A session? In fact, I'm going to invite um, the folks at the Bank of England, so uh, um, Angus and, and Andy Beal, to just um, um, sh kick off this piece so far. So, Angus and or Andy, would you like to share your initial thoughts whilst everyone else in the session is gearing up to make the point that they wish to make? Angus and or Andy, thank you. Andy Beale, go for it. Okay. <laughs> it's always uh, difficult, isn't it, with one of those situations when the, when the doors open and multiple people can step through it. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously it's been uh, incredibly helpful to get the wisdom of so many people of this crowd together. Um, you know, I, I suppose what struck me is the, you know, the, the clarity on, on the sort of the conditions where it's where it's going to work and be successful the clarity on the vision of what it could deliver but also you know working through the the stepping stones of of, of, of what what those starting points are going to be so that people can actually look and see and and, and feel a difference um in, in what they're doing and um you know as as has been noted you know the technology is all there that isn't that isn't the issue that isn't the problem the issue is is what we as people uh, put put in the way to, to make it happen. So you know, it, it's um, there's so much content here <laughs> that that uh, I think the process of sort of working through it, analysing it, seeing what it means, and seeing what it means in terms of sort of you know what 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 we should be doing as as regulators and and working with the bank and other stakeholders. Um, but I, you know, I, I was heartened by the stories of of where it can work in the UK where we can take a bit of a lead uh, and then help help to sort of do things internationally and that has happened in multiple areas um, so I was heartened by that but also um, uh, you know chastened by the experiences in financial services in the UK in the last few years as well so uh, I, I think we need to, to to sort of be be careful about what those tentative steps are but I'm going to enjoy going through the content and, and, and sort of working out what this what this plan looks like Thanks very much indeed, Andy. Uh, Angus, if you have anything you'd like to share now, please go for it. Otherwise, we'll open things up for uh, wider contributions from the rest of the group. Angus, anything from yourself? I think that's a no. So let's open it right up. So please just raise, raise your hand, wave away if you'd like to uh, share a point. We have uh, 20 minutes or so of general Q&A and discussion. I'd be particularly keen to hear from anybody that hasn't yet had a chance to... Uh, say what they would like to say. Thank you. We have Alan King waving his hand. Alan, you're off mute, so please do fire away. Please do introduce yourselves, folks. You won't all know each other, so if you don't mind just succinctly introducing yourself first, Alan, and please make your point. Thank you. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm Alan King. I work for IBM Research. Um, right now we're looking at digital assets and payments, uh, but I have a long-standing interest in uh, things that Alan Mandelowitz and Jeff Braswell and Willie uh, Bramowitz are talking about. Um, my, uh, one of the things that came up in our group was to come up with something practical that we could succeed at. And um, the, the um, most experienced of us said, let's narrow down. And 
um, my interpretation of narrowing down is um, to, to move forward, let's double down on the budding relationship between Bank of England and Actus. Why not? It's, it's moving, it's the train. And perhaps we could help in um, looking at a particular challenge in a systemic institution. For example, looking at particular contracts that are considered systemic and that are handled by central counterparties and novated, for which institutions have to allocate capital. And by adopting Actus as a standard and all of the other information, it's a big challenge to do it. There are clauses, legal clauses, there are um, events, uh, they're just a tremendous challenge in, in doing it. But if it can be done, and if it's narrow enough, then we might have a chance to do it. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. Um, very, very encouraging comments from you, sir. Thank you very much. Who would like to now make the point? Please just wave your hand at me, if you'd like to go. Uh, Mr. Alan Grody. Hi, Alan. And by the way, Anna, thank you again for the uh, information about that speech that Andy Haldane gave. We did reach out to Andy, to see Andy Haldane at the Bank of England to see if he could join us today. His diary meant that he couldn't, but we did certainly try. And I have put his speech into the chat. Thank you again, sir, for making me aware of it. Alan, please uh, share with us what you're thinking. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I, I second Alan King's uh, view that uh, given uh, the head start the B of E and Actus has to proceed along those lines. Uh, however, I think there's another activity that's proceeding along global lines, and that is the uh, complete uh, uh, global standards initiatives that brings the LEI, the UTI, the UPI, and the common data elements. That All of that is out there. So um, if we can hasten its implementation and use this uh, universal standard, I think it would um, uh, embellish the implementation of ACTUS in any of the um, uh, institutions that the Bank of England uh, oversees. I champion the uh, three systemically important financial institutions that come under the FCA, because if they each implement one piece of it, then the B of E can aggregate the same data across these systemically important institutions uh, for a risk analysis. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much indeed. Some very, very clear thoughts there. Uh, absolutely superb. Um, I think somebody made the point earlier, there's loads of content, there really is. Uh, this is wonderful stuff. Mr. Rich Robinson, please unmute and uh, go for it, sir. Thank you. And please Hi. remember to introduce yourself at the beginning. Thanks, Rich. Sorry, yeah. Uh, Rich Robinson, uh, I'm at Bloomberg, working on open standards and, and strategy around that. I came from the industry, so I actually uh, was co uh, the chair of the ISO group for the UTI standard. I uh, co-chair a lot of different groups and, and whatnot as well, involved in a lot of different standards organizations. Anyway, um, I would counter, and, and I board my breakout group with this, uh, I got really involved in applied linguistics over the past few years, and uh, I'm going to offer that there can be no common financial language across the industry, and global standards uh, is a bad uh goal to try and achieve. There are certain things that it may be common that we may be able to use, but that is a very small and finite universe. Uh, our standardization should, must be, should focus more on uh, identifying the different communities that exist within financial services. Uh, fixed income is very different than equity, very different than derivatives. Front office is very different than back office. Uh, investment managers and brokers, everybody has different language and they store data in that language so that when a community comes in and looks at that data that doesn't belong to the community that created that data in the first place they will misinterpret it because they are looking at it in their own context as opposed to the context it was stored in uh, I, I think bringing in applied linguistics as a uh, discipline to marry up with the technology solutions and tools that are out there would be helpful as opposed to 
one, trying to solve everything through technology and two, trying to make everybody speak Esperanto as opposed to, you know, understanding everybody speaks a different language. Some of us are bilingual, some of us are multilingual, but we all have a, uh, a core language that we understand and not everybody speaks the same languages. Rich, thank you very much indeed. That's some very wise counsel there. I can see we've got some digital hands gone up. I can, um, people, are, people are demonstrating their, mm -hmm. their confidence with Zoom now. So we've got Chris Dre, we've got Andy Aikenhead, and then Willie Brown that's gave me a big old fashioned wave. <laughs> and then we'll go to David Blaskowski. I love saying David's name, David Blaskowski. It sounds great. Christian Dre, over to you. Go for it. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, basically, uh, uh, just by way of brief introduction, uh, I was the, uh, the founding president of XPRL Switzerland, so the uh, Swiss jurisdiction for XPRL, uh, and also the uh, uh, past president and uh, CEO of the CFA Society. So that's basically my, uh, my uh, interest to be here as well. So the CFA obviously stands for Chartered Financial Analyst. So what I'm really interested in is is the use uh, of uh, of reporting um, and standard reporting, uh, preferably uh, for the for the purpose of analysis from the investor perspective. Uh, so from the people who have actually uh, who, who put their money where their mouth is, um, and uh, and that's that's why I'm also very keen on understanding uh, uh, how this is actually how this product uh, is actually gearing up in that sense. Uh, is this actually just for the purpose uh, of, uh, of satisfying regulatory responsibilities towards financial stability and whatnot? Uh, or would it, should it also be um, uh, helping us uh, investors uh, make sense of the different business models, performance uh, of, the, uh, of the investment uh, vehicles uh, that, uh, that we're looking at uh, uh, <clears throat> overall? And the overall language, by the way, to the predecessor speaker is cash flows, valuations. Mm -hmm. And everybody actually speaks that language. Thank you, Chris, very much indeed. I think the next person on the list of questions is, is Mr. Andy Aikenhead. And I'll just briefly mention this to everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Transparency Task Force has you know, zero resource. I continuously amaze myself what myself and my colleagues can do with zero resource. And one of the reasons we're able to function with nothing is because people, kind people like Andy Aikenhead, give us their time on a voluntary basis to help us with different things. So Andy, please uh, introduce yourself, both in terms of what you normally do and also the work that you're kindly doing for the TTF. And then please move into your point. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. So yeah, Andy Aikenhead and I work, well, a founder and, and partner of a, a firm called Axelate. One of uh, the areas we're working actually is, is, is addressing cultural obstacles to change. Uh, and most of our work has been in, in the financial services world. Uh, with TTF, so I, I've known Andy for probably about a year, um, but we, we talked earlier this year about the way that it was working and I've been helping them a little bit with the organisation and project management of some of the stuff they're doing. So uh, and coming from that project management perspective, I guess my initial question uh, before anybody else started asking was, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, and uh, Alan and, uh, well, two Alans have talked about actors, uh, but you know, whether it's actors or not, that's one part of it. And I think, you know, a couple of other elements that uh, have been raised, I've seen in the chat. So Gavin's mentioned the whole thing, you know, we've got data, we've got messaging, we've actually got the infrastructure, the plumbing, as it were, below that, that we have to think about. But also, you know, what's the scope and where does the sponsorship come from to, to, to effectively make this happen? So I think Alistair made a point about, you know, is this on the radar of the sub senior people in the regulatory landscape? And if it is, you know, how do we engage them? And then how do we make, how do we turn this as somebody uh, said to me the other day, how do you turn it from pub to practice? You know, the conversation down the pub that has an idea to something that actually becomes practical and actually implementable. Uh, and the number of steps. So we have to think about that. I'm not offering solutions at the moment, but I, I you know, we, we, we do have to think through those steps. So Andy, Andy, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put an idea out here. Um, I, I read the speech that um, Andy Haldane gave about data standards. I think it's from about seven or eight years ago. And it's very clear from the speech that he was articulating a vision and that vision really does correspond very, very well indeed with what we are all trying to do today. 
So I, I, I promise Andy Aitkenhead, I will do all I can to speak with um, Angus at the Bank of England and Andy Neal at the FCA and their colleagues to see if we might be able to get Andy Haldane himself to in some way become a sponsor of a project because you're absolutely right. This is something that needs high level buying from key organizations. And I'm very confident that having Andy Haldane's blessing, support, endorsement, uh, sponsorship for want of a better word, will mean that we can move further quicker. So that's a fantastic point, Mr. Aikenhead. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. David Blaskowski, uh, your point, please, sir. Thank you. And then we'll go to Gavin Starks. It just a, a small point, building on some of the items that, that were, were, were said before. I, I mean, simplicity, you know, and focus, there are common elements that cut across these different things. As, as, uh, as Chris said, cash flow is a universal language. Uh, accounting is not a universal language, much as it aspires to be. Um, in, in coming up with a grand theory of financial information, many, many, many would would be uh, leaders have have come to their death on the rocks. Um, you know, one of the challenges and, and is keeping it simple, as 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 Andy Haldane had put it in a paper just a couple months before the one that, that Alan Grody so uh, thoughtfully shared. I was just called a dog with a frisbee, a dog and a frisbee, and that you know, that there's a heuristic by which a dog is able to do the amazingly complex act of catching a Frisbee. Um, oh. Focusing on small things, getting them done effectively. Actus is an example of that. I've actually used Actus. I led a project at a, at a bank that proved it worked. It's handling one very important domain as opposed to wanting to go after solving the entire problem, which um, uh, will find itself, which, which won't work out very well and, and an effort will dribble down into, um, you know, into, into irrelevance. So, Let's choose a good target. David, thank you very much indeed. And I, 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 wonderful input. Uh, I would love, please, a link to that uh, dog frisbee uh, PC you just referred to. We can share it. If you can find it and whack it into the chat, David, that would be even better. We're not going to go to Gavin Starks because I missed out Willie. How could I forget Willie? Um, <laughs> Willie, over to you, then we'll go to Gavin. Thank you. Actually, it was already said. You know, I just wanted to give uh, some response to Rich. You know, cash flow is really the universal language. And cash flows and data is an algorithm. And algorithms are mathematical things and they are the same all over the world. And yes, it's a narrow, small piece, but a very important piece of finance. And that can be standardized huh? because it's a clear agreement which must be understood by both parties the same. And it's an undisputable fact. Yeah, okay. that's it. And, and it was that point that I absolutely got on the 18th of June last year in Zurich when Willie presented. And it was that point that opened my mind up to the possibility of using mathematics as the common denominator amongst all of this. We're going to go to Gavin, then we're going to go to Alan Mendelowitz. So Gavin Starks, thank you. Thanks. Just to sort of amplify some of the, the points that have already been made, but I think the, drawing them into some sharp focus. Things that can be standardized globally are very, very rare. You know, we've not managed it with electricity, for example, since we invented our utilities. Um, we did manage it, we have managed it with the web, which is a real anomaly. You know, it's, it was accidental. It's, I think broadly because the engineers got there first and nobody else understood what they were doing until it was kind of too late. Um, but building on that, this sort of minimum viable layer of the stack, if you like, that we can commoditize. And I would separate out data from algorithms, from rules, and create that stack so that in different territories there can be variation. But there's certain elements, and we've already got the mechanics, if you like, the architecture of the web to build upon. And it is you know, demonstrably the most successful information architecture in history. What's happened with open banking, because, because we open sourced it, it's been copied. Now in territories like New Zealand, they've copied over 90% of it. Um, in other territories, they're taking it and tweaking it for their local uh, objectives and local cultures. And it's a cultural question about how individual territories want their markets to evolve. Now there's lots of things that some countries are doing that I think fundamentally break everything and you're gonna end up in a more of an AOL, MSN type of world rather than an open web type of world. But that's up to the individual countries to make their own decisions around. But having said that, the underlying kind of architecture here of the web, if we can just work out what's the minimum layer that we could all agree on, that nobody's gonna get something special by owning a slightly different way of doing it, 
then everybody wins. And I think we're in this super interesting transitional period right now, where if we get some of the wiring right around open banking, we're going to set a precedent that could be applied worldwide. And again, some of the PCs are, are people are just saying, oh yeah, we don't need to compete on that. We'll just get on with it. Other areas, they are all, there's going to be a bun fight around. But we're, we are at, we're right in the middle of this kind of creative destructive period. Yeah. And so the more we can help come together to Andy's point, come together, shape this together, look at what works, look at what doesn't look, work, look at where the things pop out the sides and don't work in different territories, the better. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Um, in the next uh, four minutes or so, we're going to have a point from Alan Mendelovitz, then Jeff Braswell. I will then formally close the session, but of course, anybody that wants to hang on for the 30 minutes of fireside chat, please do so. Alan, to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, um, it, this discussion brings to mind that uh, my view of what the future of the financial contract is, is a hybrid contract, where the legal issues are a natural language, because you can't represent them mathematically, but the cash flow obligations are represented mathematically through algorithms. And I think that that would be a major breakthrough because as Christian uh, Dreyer pointed out, the cash flow is, is numbers and numbers are a universal language. Everybody uses the same numbers. And so I think uh, you know, that's a way forward and uh, keeping in mind that uh, everything in a bank, whether it's transaction processing or risk management or liquidity analysis or pre-trade analysis, all starts out with the math, the cash flows. And so having a banking system where you have one representation, a golden copy of the contract in a write once, read many times solution for managing your data, you have the golden copy of the algorithmic representation of the cash flows, and then you tap that for all the applications that require cash flows within the organization. Alan, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to Jeff, Jeff Braswell. Please introduce yourself, Jeff, because I don't think everybody knows you yet. Thank you. Um, sure. Well, I'm Jeff Braswell. I, I've been doing some work with Actus. I was recently uh, on the board of the Global LAI Foundation, and in the 90s, I had uh, successful enterprise risk management solutions uh, business. Um, I just wanted to uh, respond to Rich Robinson's comment and actually say that uh, I, I agree with Rich's observation that uh, that different business lines, different domains have different ways of describing things. A, a coupon uh, in, a, in, a, in a bond is not the same thing as a coupon where you clip out and get a discount at a supermarket. Uh, the, I think the issue here is that if all that you have is a data definition of terms, uh, in a language or with some vocabulary, you are open to interpretation as to what those terms mean. Whereas if you in fact have the definition of terms that are in fact applied to how they are to be processed, i.e. with the algorithms that are associated with the terms, then you have the ability to uh, take those terms and once they're uh, defined, uh, get more uh, commonly shared results. So I would agree with Rich that common standards in terms of strictly definitions alone and vocabularies are like languages. And yet, if you do look at language, all languages are just different sounds to identify the same things when they exist in the same place, like snow or corn or things that are in the real world. And to the extent that financial contracts are in the real world and can have precise definitions for how they work out, then it's important to simply have the implementation of what those terms mean in order to give them meaning as opposed to leave them up to uh, interpretation in different languages by different speakers in different domains. Uh Jeff, thank you very much. I think your, uh, the way you articulated that point was very, very clear indeed. Uh, I've never thought about that idea before. Different languages, but fundamentally, all the languages are made up of sounds. I, I get your point. That's, that's fascinating. I know that Alistair Milne would like to uh, share some information. So, Alistair, please. Hello there. Yep. Um, I think I've got an old version of Zoom on. I don't seem to have be able to wave my hand digitally, but I got through to you. Um, so th this is a, a little bit speculative, but it's, an, it's a thought I've had for some time, and some people may shoot me down on this, but uh, look, I'm an economist by, by, for, for many years, and it, a lot of this is about incentives. And there was a nice comment somewhere about, you know, what are the incentives to make uh, uh, senior management jump in the right direction we, we want them to go in. And it's, it's partly about that there's a bottom line, and it's partly about avoiding jail. Uh, but I, I, I have a third incentive, which I think, potentially could drive standards a long way. Um, put simply, could we not say that if your contract is not interpretable 
via the act of standard, then it has no legal standing in court. So if you want to claim a cash flow off someone and it's not presented in a way which any, any outsider can use an API and check the cash flow, well, you, th th they may owe you money, but, but tough, you're not going to get it through anything other than goodwill. Um, so the, the, the whole background of how we treat gambling very differently than we do um, formal financial contracts within the regulatory sphere, I think there are some... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, an extreme proposal, but I wonder whether we shouldn't be thinking of quite radical solutions of that nature. Uh, Alistair, thank you very much indeed. I can see Willie's um, put yeah. his hand up there. Just before we go to Willie, just before we go to Willie, because I'm very keen that I, I, I do what I said I would, which is to formally close the session at four o'clock. We, Willie, we will get to you in just a moment. So here's my plan, folks. I'm just going to take a few moments to thank you all very, very much indeed for your participation uh, i am staggered really staggered by the quality and the quantity of content that we've managed to bring together so the formal part of this session is is, is finishing now i propose we have a literally a two minute comfort break just to grab yourself a cup of tea or a glass of water or whatever you need to do for a couple of minutes we'll then reconvene for anybody that wants to reconvene and we'll then go into what we describe as the far side chat which will be discussion like this um, free flowing, free structure, and sometimes it brings the service absolute nuggets that really will be of tremendous value. I'll say to Andy Beale at the Financial Conduct Authority, and of course Angus at the Bank of England, that we'll fix up a debrief session in the next few days, work out what the next step is. But I absolutely assure you, everybody, if anybody wants to continue in the dialogue, uh, we'll be able to do that. We'll fix up another meeting like this in, let's say, a month or so's time. Um, feel free to email me anything you want. Feel free to share with me anything that you want and I'll do my utmost to cascade it with everybody else. So that's it, folks. Thank you very much. That's the formal session over, but we'll keep the link live. Thank you for the applause that uh, we're getting from here and there. It's been a great session. Method exceeded all my expectations. Thank you very much for helping me to graph the session as well. If there happens to be anybody left when I come back in a couple of minutes' time, We'll carry on from there, okay, folks? Thank you very much. Wonderful. And, uh, Wonderful. Alistair, good to see you again. Uh, hello, yes, good to see you. Thank you. Back in <laughs> two minutes. Carry on chuckling my monkey yourself. Thank you. There's a, there's a well, well, well not everybody here is new to me, but there's a bit of the old uh, uh, well met, hail, hail old friend, well met. <laughs> well, we have, uh, you know, Jim Dorothy, you and I were a part of the group that worked on that paper back in yeah, the Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Um, that was that was a very important paper, yeah. the engineering study. So it's good to see you. Yeah, I, I think this a couple I, I, of your uh, Alistair. I posted a couple of your joint papers in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah. I I regret that our uh, our other collaborators, two of our other collaborators, are not with us, unfortunately, on that from that paper. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're all getting on. <laughs> yeah, well, we we miss we certainly miss Ken. Um, yeah, and. Uh, and Norman as well. Yeah. What I really love about this entire morning is that it made clear what I agreed with all of you about, and that was enormous. And what I thought was different in my own thinking. And there I found that we had something really new. And it's important for me to find a way, and I am trying with Andy Agadangelo and succeeding in reaching out to each of you in your way. Uh, and it is possible to do this kind of consecutive translation of ideas and thoughts and signals as subtle as intent and ways of countering fraud. And, and, and I know it sounds crazy, but I'd like to explore that with each of you. And I put my, uh, or I guess Andy has the contact information. Thrilled to see all of you. Thank you, Michael. Um, wonderful. Okay, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised just how many people have got uh, some appetite for a bit more. So I promised we'd go to Willie, so let's do exactly that. Mr. Willie Bramitz, uh, please uh, speak. Thank you. I just want to follow up with what Alistair said yeah, just before, at his last uh, statement. Actually, um, 
what you propose is becoming partially true now in, in bits and pieces on the blockchain. Because there the contract just exists as an algorithm. <laughs> There's nothing else. So nothing to dispute on that level. Um, the yeah. disputes only come if people don't pay then and that's still possible uh, and so on. Huh? Uh, but the rest is, is clear. Uh, and of yeah. course, that would be equally possible for any contract. Yeah, yeah I, 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 have I, I completely about, agree. Just quickly yeah. go back. I, so, I have mixed, um, um, Alan and I had a quick conversation a couple of days ago and touched on, I have mixed feelings about blockchain. I, th I think there's a, a lot of oversell and... Um, you know, to some extent, many of those people are trying to evade regulation as opposed right. to live in an honest way within within regulation. But uh, yeah, point taken. If we if, if everything becomes as digitally native as that, then then it becomes much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. no, it's it's really just about the the digital first issue. Uh, is it is is the contract a paper metaphor, uh, or is it a metaphor that only exists in bits and bytes? Uh, that that makes the whole difference. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm fully with that, uh, but Andy, uh, Andy, uh, I guess then we, I've got a question for you. Uh, yeah. We we now have UK uh, regulatory institutions here in this group. Uh, did you also contact uh, other uh, uh, other regulators from uh, from other countries, the Swiss ones, for instance? Because uh, uh, if if the, uh, the if the scope the remit uh, of the discussion really is to go. Uh, across borders, uh, then uh, then uh, that should be reflected in the composition. Right? It, it, it most certainly should. Uh, you, Chris, your, your point is val very valid. Um, the simple answer is no, I didn't, but I would I like to. We've got some very good contacts amongst the regulators in the US and the Far East, um, but I'm very keen to be introduced to anybody in any regulatory capacity or otherwise that could be on the same kind of vibe, the same wavelength as us in terms of trying to work together so haven't done it Chris yet not because I don't want to because I just haven't been able to and I'd love your assistance if you'd like to offer any in making that happen thank you Chris yeah. thank you uh, but what we can say here you know like the University of Zurich is, uh, is starting a project or is it wants to do a project with the Swiss uh, uh, National Foundation Science Foundation uh, and that's about regulation and actors how to use it uh, and there the Bank of England wrote, uh, signed um, a statement, you know, that they want to promote it as well. So there is already a little bit going on in this direction. Thanks, Willie. Thank you. I'm, yeah. going, to invite, I'm going to invite you. Okay. Sorry. No, okay, I'm just going to, all I was going to say was in the States, the uh, FDIC, the Deposit Insurance Corporation, has initiated a rapid pro prototyping competition to come up with an alternative to the call reports. Okay, that's an interesting development. Thank you very much. I encourage I anybody it, who hasn't yet had a chance to say anything to uh, to do so. Let's go to, uh, I'll just pick out one or two names. So, uh, Mr. Guy Rackham, is there anything you would like to share with us, please? Yeah, I thought I was going to get away with it, Andy. No, um, I could give a, obviously I'm not coming with a regulator's hat on. I, I, for people who don't know, I'm, I'm Actually, freelance, I can't speak for Bayern, but I'm the lead architect at Bayern, and that's an organization that's coming up with a standard component model, a, a canonical set of Lego for, for banking. And Bruno put us in touch with Actus uh, a year ago, and we got extremely excited because uh, thinking of algorithmic data, I think, is, is a quantum step forward. Um, being able to model future cash flows of instruments in their standard way is fixing the plumbing if you like so from us we look at it top down and what are all the lego the control structures that uh, makes up a bank to then be able to for the key stuff which is the financial instrument data which uh, to rich's point which i thought was terrific earlier on is probably the one set of data that you can have a standard for to have that standard but as algorithmic data completely changes um, how you can model uh, the bank relationship we did a case study with uh, willie and, and alan and, and jeff a few months ago, looking at a cross product perspective for a customer doing future cash flows, seeing how they make decisions. If you look at where the banking's going, open banking, the componentization of open banking, the modularization of it, having a data standard or an algorithmic data standard like this uh, is going to be transformational. So I, I'm really excited by where it's going. Um, I think having excellent data can only simplify regulatory compliance. And indeed I've seen regulatory compliances 
almost encouraging banking to do the right thing more than controlling banking. So, um, you know, I asked that question earlier, what is it a regulator needs to see that a bank shouldn't want to see itself to control its own internal yeah. um, machinations? Um, and if you look at regulatory uh, rules and guidance as actually making the banks more competitive and more nimble, um, supported by an algorithmic data standard to, to share the information, I think um, is really going to enable open banking. So that was a ramble, but you put me on the spot, Andy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really glad I did, Guy, because I know you've got a hell of a lot to offer. Thank you very much, whether, the all, whether with your buy-in hat on or, your, or not your buy-in hat on. And I think I'm right in saying that buy-in is the banking industry architecture network. That's, yes, that's right. You remembered it. Good for you. There we go, in case there's anybody that doesn't know. There's, um, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent, so just bear with me, folks. I'm going to go off into my little dreamland. Uh, one of my all-time heroes is a chap called Colin Chapman. Nothing to do with data. Colin Chapman was the genius behind Lotus Cars. And he ended up producing with very little money, uh, very, very high performing cars that literally ended up winning, you know, winning Formula One. And one of his kind of um, models was to utilize various components from various places with his road cars. So he would, for example, have a, an engine block from Ford, um, a gearbox from Renault, a suspension from from Vauxhall, for example. And one of the ideas that I keep coming back to here is the possibility of doing something similar within this space. The idea of having, if you like, best of breed components that somehow match up very well together. And the ones that sort of spring to mind are, for example, uh, perhaps making use of some of the architectural engineering within Bayern, plus some of the a financial algorithmic contracty stuff within actors and possibly using for example GoKnown. GoKnown has got something an incredibly powerful uh, data pipe that's like ultra ultra secure and I'm sure there are many many others um, so this idea of kind of working out what is in the parts bin and, and assembling something quite beautiful from different component parts from somewhere else is, is actually quite appealing to me I really like the idea of that and maybe that's the kind of thinking we can uh, we can absorb um that's me back back from my little land of imagination and fantasy and cars uh who'd like to share something that is particularly i'm keen to hear from people who haven't yet spoken mr michael shipton could i invite you please to introduce yourself and uh, explain your interest in this project and please do share with us what you're thinking thank you pleasure yes um i introduced it at the beginning but i'll do it again uh, i'm from euroclear and so we're not a bank, but our key interest is in the securities industry. And uh, when Alan was talking about the uh, regulating a trillion uh, dollar sort of deposits in Euroclear's data pile, if I put it that way, there's about at the moment 34 trillion euros, dollars, whatever you want to say, it's all getting sort of one to one of assets, mainly bonds. And my interest in the, in the, in the actors or, or the representation is at the end of the day, equities, we've talked about equities has its own language is something different. We have a lot of those as well. Bonds is one of the most fundamental financial products uh, that deals with cash flows, deal with events, deals with various things. And it's still quite a, and it's a very important industry when it comes to the financial market stabilities. So my, my interest is, how can I, on the one side, improve the process to stop fails, re-entering of data in that whole value chain of how a bond from the start of, an, of a company or a, or a country wanted to issue a debt, how that goes through syndicating of banks, payment agents, or whatever, and then ends up in, in a Euroclear, or if I take an American terms, a DT. Uh, of a Fedwire or DTCC, if DTC if it's uh, if it's equities or in Clearstream, the two main ones in Europe, uh, in Clearstream, how can that process become more effective, more efficient, more precise? This whole thing about precision, uh, such that rekeying of data doesn't have to happen. That's the one part of it. There's the other part of it that if that is in an analyzable form, where what if questions can be posed on bonds for the future then that is good for the owners of those bonds in their portfolio, and it must be good for regulators of what that means for a, a country, a market. So in that sense, I see these things that could meet, if possible, with a sort of a, a nice way in the middle, that 
that what a regulator wants looking at the stability of a market is what a what an investor wants to look at the stability of his portfolio or i with my pension fund not as an investor but i want to look at when i retire is there going to be enough money there to pay my kids education whatever it is it's it's the same kind of question just posed at a different level of aggregation and what one uh, let's say financial participant of a, of a system can see they can never see the whole thing and so i think it's, it was mentioned that we as a at Euroclear, we don't see regulation as a burden regulation is there to keep everything clean keep everything okay because what we need is transparency and trust yeah. and the more transparency there is by definition usually the more trust there is as long as you can match that transparency with the with the requirements of privacy and uh, i'm I don't come from the standards area. I come from the area of people have problems they want to be have solved. Yeah. So I try to match. Yeah. Can I see a problem, a pain point, and can I see a way of addressing that pain point in a manner that's that's open for future development? And hence my interest in a the topics you're discussing here and and b uh, in uh, the standards that are around whether they, they are actors, which is broad, or the ones coming out of ISDA for, for derivative contracts. But it's less in the banking itself, but more in this securities market, which has different questions. But at the fundamental, it's still about, if I take this, uh, what was being said, it's still about cash flows and obligations. And either the cash flow happens or it doesn't happen and predicting a, a, a future. And hence my interest in this, uh, in this discussion. Michael, thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Wonderful input, wonderful input. Um, I would be I would be nuts not to um, mention my book, given what you were saying just now about the importance of trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. We've published a book, folks. Here it is. And the book's title is Why We Must Rebuild Trustworthiness and Confidence in Financial Services and How We Can Do It. And believe me, if you haven't bought it yet, it's just a matter of time before you do. On that note, I'm going to go to Kazi Razvi to introduce himself and please share with us what he's thinking. Thank you, Kazi. Great. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I am uh, from CFA Institute. So I think I have very similar views uh, as Chris explained earlier. He's uh, uh, from CFA Society Swiss. Um, I'm from the Institute uh, uh, representing Global. Uh, but I think I am very, this is the first time actually I'm here, uh, but I'm very interested um, in the application of it. And I know that you're discussing mainly from bonds. And previously I was in a rating agency, so I absolutely agree with everything you have said about bonds. But I think it's far more broader. It has, uh, if you look at even a company uh, accounts, there's a lot of uh, cash flow contracts. Lease is a cash flow contract for future obligations. Um, revenue, a lot of cash flows are, if, if it's long-term contracts, it's already fixed how they will be generated. And from that perspective, I think it's, it's very, very important and not just from regulatory capital perspective, but also if you consider from audit reforms perspective, now we're having issues where auditors are missing the actual cash. Um, and we have been advocating for audit reforms and we're saying like, look, you need to bring in technology and the lot of consistent cash flow side or which is directly linked with the source document, you should automate and make sure that auditors look at data, uh, because I basically consider two types of data. One is your raw data, which actually you just mentioned from the source document cash flows. And then you have a biased data, which is basically fair value or where management is putting their views on it. So that they could, auditors could in, uh, invest more time on that biased data and provide graduated. And I think that's, that's a very critical point um, uh, that I would take, and I, I would definitely would be working closely with uh, Will, Willie, uh, and uh, Alan, uh, but I think I would just come back to the uh, point. I think Alistair, he's still around or he left? Alistair's jumped off, yes. Okay, but I think he made a very good point um, because uh, so if, if it's a legal, if you link it with the mandatory legal contract, although I, it looks very um, uh, undemocratic by forcefully making that, but <laughs> it, it, it makes sense that because but that also means that you should link it with the legal system as well. That legal system only recognizes that as a legal uh, contract and, and your legal, and I, I think it will also bring in efficiencies in your legal processes and other stuff. So that idea is something interesting. But overall, I, I found this very 
um, interesting and very, um, uh, I think, uh, relevant uh, for what we do. Jasmine, thank you very much for being with us. More and more great input. There's some wonderful information in the chat as well. Um, Mr. Alan Mendelowitz, you have uh, impressed me once again, sir, with your ability to raise a digital hand. <laughs> thank you. Over to you, Alan. Yeah, the, uh, the only observation I want to add to the discussion is the issue of strategic vision. Um, I think that we absolutely have to have in mind the end point that we want to get to. I and mean, I know the folks in the Actus world have a very clear vision of the end point. And the reason why that's essential is if we don't know where the end point is, we're never going to get there. All the, you're not going to get massive reform in one moment or one you know, swipe of your hand. But what you really need to think about is the stepping stones that lead you to the ultimate goal. Each of the partial reforms, each of the partial changes that get implemented are successful if they are stepping stones on the way to a clearly defined ultimate vision. Uh, absent the ultimate vision in the test of whether the stepping stones will get you there, you wind up on a dead end and uh, you've spent a lot of money, a lot of resources, you've uh, you know, taken a lot of people's attention and time and focus and you don't get to where you need to go and it's gonna make trying to fix it even harder. Alan, I think you made that point beautifully, sir. Thank you very, very much indeed. I'm going to invite uh, Jim Northey, who I've had the pleasure of speaking to for the first time, I think it must have been about three or four weeks ago, uh, to unmute if he's still with us and to share his thoughts uh, and then to Terry Rupp as well. So uh, Jim, if you can unmute, please do so and speak. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks Andy and thanks for putting this together. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed listening. Uh, I've had some internet trouble so some of you may have seen me coming and going. But uh, anyway, uh, for the parts I, I uh, was able to listen to, I enjoyed it. I, I think uh, uh, there's a couple of important things to uh, be aware of. Uh, one is uh, we're, uh, you know, the the move to, uh, can everybody still hear me, by the way? Just check. You can, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can. I, I, I think that uh we've in terms of financial data financial instrument data we, we've gone through this sort of evolution from we, we've tried uh, relational databases and relational databases with by temporality represented and then we went through this market data definition language phase uh at the uh, around the 2000s uh, when everything was going to be xml schema and then we went to the ontology approaches and uh you know while the ontology approach was fascinating uh, as a practitioner someone who's built uh, reference data platforms before i said yeah okay this is great but i see no practical use in any way that i could actually use this to implement something and uh but then when um we started moving uh the structure of information, the metadata, and set it next to the instance data and not knowledge graphs and graph databases. And we added uh, the fact that uh, you have these entities that can have properties that change over time. You know, that actually made me want to go back and actually start to build, uh, you know, systems again, because I saw an approach that actually has uh, uh, some value for, from a practical standpoint. Uh, the other two things I'd like to interject is, is that, um, you know, we, we all see the, the, the flaws in perimeter um, network security. And I think that there are some approaches that are standardized where we can actually have fine grained differential access to information and make it so that people can manage their own data and if, if the data is issued by someone who can then delegate, who can access that data, isn't that far better than, than taking a whole group of systems and, and taking the computational power of Connecticut to try to, to, to sort of enforce some sort of a consensus? I think there are practical ways today where we can share data, share it safely, uh, and have the data protect itself at, mo at rest at most and during calculation. 
And, and if you add on to that, you know, something like a distributed identify, identification system like the handle system, combined with um, a, an actus description of the, the ultimate language for describing finance and financial instruments is mathematical. If you combine project actus, with with the be, with the best parts of uh, what we now have yes. is graph technology combined with CKM. I think you have something we can implement today. Uh, you know, the, the elusive company file that people have been wanting for years. The, the company file sits out there. The regulator goes and gets what they need out of it. That that file's kept up to date all the time. Those credentials are delegated to the regulator. All this reporting and sending files and all this other stuff of messaging goes away. We share the state out there. And so uh, that's where we're trying to take ISO TC68. We also have uh, an initiative within FIX where we're trying to use these same technologies. We have a micropayments initiative in Brazil going on using the same technologies and, and none of them involve distributed ledger technology. So just my thoughts on where things are going. And uh, I do hope that we can uh, somehow further incorporate ACTUS into our ISO standards because I think there are, there are, there are it's, it's a, it's, you know, uh, it, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, we, why, why should we use the mass? Well, we use mass because they make sense. They represent reality and they allow us to think, introspect, and, and quantify uh, the world we live in. And I think Actus is a, an exemplary version of that. So uh, thanks. I really enjoyed listening to everybody today. With that, I'll just shut up. Jim, thank you very much indeed. It's wonderful to have you with your background and your credibility involved in this initiative. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Terry Rupp, please may I invite you to uh, take yourself off mute and uh, introduce yourself, Terry, because not everybody knows you on the session and share with, the, share with us what you're thinking and then I'll start bringing the session to a close. Thank you. Oh, good day, guys. Um, thank you very much. Um, at least Guy Rackham and Willie um, have had the misfortune of knowing me for a period of time. Um, you know, I, I just want to tell you, first of all, thanks for bringing this group together. I think that it's a great first effort. And when groups such as this come together for the first time, there is a natural tendency to try boiling the ocean or maybe multiple oceans. And, and I think that what we really need to do at this point in time is uh, apply functional decomposition and let's start breaking these problems down domain by domain and, and pick something that is achievable for us. So I love what Alan said about having a destination in mind because destinations have waypoints and, and we need to pick some realizable waypoints along this journey that, that are achievable that we can hold up and, and wave to everybody and say, okay, look, you know, it's been this way for decades, but we can change it. So Andy, I, I love your car analogies. Um, people, that, people that know me or have known me for a long time um, will tell you that I've spent way too much of my wife's money um, racing over the years. And, and there's never been a car or anything with a motor that I've raced that comes from factory ideally optimized. So, so yeah. things have to change. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll swear one of two things. Either this guy has a really short attention span or he can't hold a job for any length of time. <laughs> I've, I've been with some very large companies um, for a protracted periods of time and, and I've been with smaller. And I can tell you that innovation doesn't typically happen in, in the largest of these companies. Things are the way they are for a particular reason and it's usually around monetization. You know, there's tremendous monetization and stability and not changing things. The stability thing is what everybody always touts. But while we have systems of record today, we also need systems of innovation and systems of differentiation. And, and a lot of that, a lot of that inspiration is going to come from the, the more nimble entities, uh, if you will, that set around the periphery. So one of the key reasons, and you know, I, I was at Sun Microsystems for probably the longest stint in my career, uh, where I built and ran the Sun Microsystems financial services practices. And, you know, we, we shifted the paradigm quite significantly there from, from the norm, from, from the classic norm, and proved that things could be done in a distributed way at that point in time. 
that everybody believed was dependent on a monolithic paradigm to do. You know, I think that, you know, there, there are various things that happen that, that cause tectonic shifts in the industry right now. And one of these things that financial institutions are going to have to get their mind around relatively soon is not just regulatory concerns, but uh, the non-banks, the, the minute that, that Google and, and Apple Pay and, and uh, Facebook, for crying out loud, others become legitimized as banks, get a banking license, they're done. You know, within 90 days, they're going to lose 30 plus percent of the deposit that they currently have. So, so things have to change, and, and we're moving very, very rapidly at this. You know, I think that um, that the Actus approach in uh, algorithmically modeling all of the contractual data gives us a unique opportunity to present to regulators, not not a tsunami of data because the regulators wouldn't know what to do with it anyhow, but the discrete data elements that they need in the time frames that they need them, the correct intervals. So, you know, I I think that we're on to something very cool here. Every, you know, we had roughly 50 people on this call. So what's that mean? We've got roughly 250 opinions, um, you know, maybe, maybe more than that. Um, but it's a beginning. We'll distill down from here. Thank well, you. Terry, thank you so much. And uh, you, you mentioned your LinkedIn profile. Please do put it into the chat so people can see if they want to take a look. Um, uh, it is there. It is there already. Wonderful. I'm going to um, I'm going to put into the chat a point you just made, which I think is going to it's going to excite me for the next three, four days. Um, the phrase you just used, Terry, was we're onto something cool here. And I can honestly tell you uh, that's what I feel as well. I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat as a as a, as a kind of memento to self, um, because that is exactly um, what I feel as well. We are onto something cool here. And the reason we are onto something cool here is because of the people getting involved and the mindset with which you're approaching this this task, this challenge, this uh, opportunity. So I just want to sort of sign off by saying thank you all very, very much. Um, I'll organize next steps. I'll figure out what those next steps are gonna be. The detail doesn't matter. What does matter is this. We all want to do something worthwhile. We can do it. Uh, it makes sense to do it. There are going to be loads of people very happy that we've done it. And um, as a consequence, I've got a feeling that for the months and hopefully years ahead, we're going to get to know each other very, very well indeed. And it's a true privilege for me to be part of this initiative. Uh, thank you all very, very much indeed. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you.